Welcome to the introduction to blockchain technology. This is the course overview, so let's go ahead and find out more about your instructor and what we're going to learn about throughout the course. My name is Joe Holbrook, and I'm the owner of a new learning platform called MyBlockchainExperts.com. I'm also out of Jacksonville, Florida. I'm an avid cryptocurrency and blockchain expert. I'm certified with numerous organizations. And I'm also a well-known cloud computing author as well. I also hold additional certs around cloud computing, IT security, and project and IT management. Let's get started finding out about what we're going to learn. But first, let's cover the course objectives. We want to make sure you gain an understanding of what a blockchain is. Understand why Bitcoin and blockchain are different. We'll also talk about the similarities. We'll gain an understanding of why the blockchain is so revolutionary. We'll then proceed and talk about ledgers, consensus, nodes, and other components of a blockchain. We'll then learn how to download your Bitcoin or Litecoin wallet. We'll also show you how a transaction works. We'll then learn about possibilities for you to learn more, such as running a blockchain as a service. Let's discuss the course overview. We have a busy course, so let's find out what we're going to learn. We're going to cover what a blockchain is, what a cryptocurrency is, key terms to know, what's the difference between a blockchain and a cryptocurrency. We'll talk about blockchain basics. We'll then proceed and talk about how a transaction works. We'll be performing several demos. And then we'll talk about components and consensus and also what mining is. We'll then proceed and talk about distributed ledgers. We'll then proceed and talk about Ethereum basics. We'll perform a demo on MetaMask. We'll proceed and talk about smart contracts and then go to another demo around IBM Blockchain as a Service. We'll then proceed and talk about use cases and creating value with blockchain. We'll then get into what Bitcoin is and talk about wallets and the different options for Bitcoin and Litecoin wallets. We'll perform some demos, proceed and talk about options to get into mining as a service. And then we'll talk about the explorers such as Etherscan and Ethernodes and Ethereum. We'll also go over to another blockchain called Corda and go through a transaction on how that works on R3 Corda. We'll then wrap it up with blockchain certifications and a short course closeout. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. What is a blockchain? Well, let's go ahead and get started trying to understand what a blockchain is and how the technology is shaping our enterprises. But also, we'll discuss some other facets of what is a block, for example, first, to help us understand how a blockchain actually works. Let's get started. A block is essentially a container data structure. In Bitcoin, basically a block can contain up to 500 transactions on average. It's going to have a digital signature, a timestamp, and relative information. Now, there's also a term around the block size, and this has always been a challenge with Bitcoin and other forks of Bitcoin such as Litecoin about how big or when or why should they increase the block size. But to, to first understand why a block is so important, think of a block as essentially an approach 
to how the blockchain itself, the ledger, is updated. The nodes all have to agree that these transactions are valid and should be written to the blockchain. Because of the amount of work and effort that it takes to solve these math problems that the miners are dealing with, and we'll focus more on how this works when we get into the mining part of the course, but realize that these computers are running really high-end GPUs and ASICs, depending on the blockchain that you're running. Bitcoin's different than Monero, and Ethereum's different than Dash. But in general, these computer nodes are expensive to run. They use a lot of electricity. But with that said, we need to understand that a block is essentially the smallest unit when we talk about a blockchain. Now, there's a course um, different block types, like for example, we'll talk about the Genesis block. But for this purpose, for this starting point, Think of the block as a data structure. A blockchain is essentially a cryptographically secured, shared, and distributed ledger. What does this all mean? Well, basically, we have a database that has cryptography that's distributed between many nodes, in some cases, thousands of nodes. It's not centralized. That's another thing to consider. These transactions, when we write them to the ledger, they're there forever. You can't delete them. It's also transformational technology. Businesses and government invest in it. They're really focusing on it right now. And as the months and years go by, I'm seeing more and more demand. It is a decentralized database. There's no question about it. Now, are there blockchains out there that are not really totally decentralized? Absolutely. To be honest, there's a lot of hybrid solutions out there now. But when we talk about cryptocurrencies, they're mainly decentralized with probably the notable exception of Ripple, which isn't really meant to be what it's acting like. But... It's it's a world we live in. Okay, a blockchain is a globally shared data structure. It is a transactional backend. Bitcoin calls it a ledger. Now, when we go to like the explorer part of the course, and you could see the transactions, and you could see um, the the wallet addresses, everything you could basically understand that it's open and permissionless. Anyone can view what's going on on the blockchain. If you have to change something, you don't really change it per se, you append that transaction. The word transaction implies in the blockchain world that you want to change two values at the same time. In reality, it's either done or it's not done. You're not going to partially add a block. It's all or nothing. Now, blockchains are generally built from these three main technologies. Peer-to-peer -peer networks. Basically, this is going to use network protocols. Could be a gossip protocol. But basically, these protocols are meant to communicate and discover other peers. We then have private keys. This is our public key infrastructure. It uses cryptography. A lot of the blockchains use SHA encryption. They use, for example, certificates, so on and so on. So it's all encrypted. Programs are going to be your code. That's going to be your transaction logic. In other words, known as a smart contract. Digital identity is going to need to be established to use most of the blockchains out there. And I say most because there's always one or two that have a different take on the world, it seems. But in reality, if you need to make a transaction, you have to have a private and a public key.
when it comes to blockchain, just realize it's revolutionary. Companies are realizing that trust is really important to their customers. And also, too, it's causing a lot of issues for the status quo. And if you get a chance to take the more advanced courses, we'll get into more of the real concerns, such as removal of intermediaries or using the blockchain for transparency. These are challenges that I think a lot of the enterprises and governments are still having concerns with. Let's review. We know that blockchain is complex technology, but in reality, the concept is really simple. It's about trust. Blockchains are ledgers. Remember, Bitcoin calls it a ledger, and it's shared between all the computers around the world. These ledgers are immutable. And lastly, remember that blockchain is not new technology, but it's a sinking of existing technologies. Let's continue to the next module. And then it also can act as a currency. There is a lot of great examples out there we'll talk about on the next slide, but in reality, a lot of them are considered cryptocurrencies, but there just isn't a lot of good use cases for most of them. The exceptions would be like Bitcoin or Litecoin, Dash, Monero. Those are frequently used, but there's a lot of others that um, just don't have uh, viable currency use cases at this point but who knows just uh, just an observation now when it comes to understanding cryptocurrencies there's a lot to it but in general you want to know that Bitcoin is considered digital gold Litecoin is generally considered digital silver because of the fact that Litecoin was a direct fork off of the Bitcoin blockchain and it was also led off by one of the blockchain main developers. Charles Lee is the main focal point of Litecoin. Now, at the time of writing, Bitcoin is still the most widely known and has the largest market cap. When we talk about cryptocurrencies, it's not just about Bitcoin. Um, essentially, there's also altcoins, as they're called, an alternative to Bitcoin. Those would be Litecoin, Monero, Dash, Ether, Ripple, etc. Pretty much anything that isn't Bitcoin is considered an altcoin. Now, for this course, we won't get too deep into the differences and you know how you trade here and there. The goal of the course was to give you that foundation and then help enable you to find out more. Now, Bitcoin was created by a discrete creator named Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009. No one knows who this person is. Bitcoin now has a fork called Bitcoin Cash, for example. Bitcoin has always been known as crypto gold because of its meteoric rise over a nice period of time. Now, Bitcoin was released essentially in a white paper in 2008, but it didn't really go live in 2009. We'll do a demo on looking for the Genesis block for the Bitcoin network. Coin market cap. Now, Coin market cap is one of the websites you go to to find out what the market capitalizations are what the um, current uh, ranking is, the market cap, the price, the volume, etc. That website has some good information on it, graphs, etc. Just one of several out there. And then an ICO is when a founder or founders of an altcoin generally decide to sell tokens and try to raise revenue for their coin offering. 
it's very similar to an IPO in the stock market. Let's go ahead and proceed on to the next module. Blockchain terms. Let's cover terminology before we get into the remaining part of the course. Let's clarify what some of the more common terms are in the world of blockchain technologies. What exactly is cryptocurrency? Well, we know that cryptocurrency is a form of digital currency and it's based on math. It uses encryption and in general, it's used to regulate essentially the units of currency and validate the transfer of funds in that cryptocurrency. Now, when we talk about cryptocurrencies, we generally mean Bitcoin, Litecoin, Monero. Um, when you hear Ethereum, sometimes people may be referring to the platform or they could be referring to the cryptocurrency. I'll talk about Ethereum and Ether and the difference between the two as well. A DApp is really a decentralized application. This is essentially an application that works by itself without anyone telling it how to operate. In other words, this application is a blockchain app that is essentially working via smart contracts and completing a task. If user A sends the funds, then user B will go ahead and transfer the property to user A, whatever the property may be. A DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization, and this is essentially an organization that is running within a set of essentially what I would call rules of code. And a good example of this is called the Augur Project. The Augur Project essentially uses a combination of blockchain AI. It's similar to like a driverless car that's able to make a decision where to pick up or drop off passengers. There's also the first real sort of venture capital funded DAO was called the DAO. This sort of didn't work out. It failed in a few months. But anyways, the theory is there, but in reality, you don't see a lot of it. But you may hear that term. Then we have decryption and encryption. Essentially, encryption is taking clear text and making it into cipher text. And then decryption is the opposite. Now, some of the terms that you're going to hear around Ethereum is going to be Ether, Ethereum, and then we'll talk about gas coming up as well. But Ether is a token of the Ethereum blockchain. This is how you pay for using the Ethereum network. That's how miners get paid. Ethereum is the actual platform itself. I like to compare Ethereum to essentially the platform where the train rides on and when you go ride the train you have to get essentially a ticket or a token to ride the train and that's what ether is it's really how you pay your fare and then we have the ethereum virtual machine known as the evm now it's written in the Solidity language. It's essentially a full node of the network. When you hear the full node term used in blockchain technology, that means there's a full copy of the blockchain on that node. And then another term that's used is gas. This is an estimate used to determine how much or a percentage as close as it can basically to how much work it has to do to get this smart contract to fruition. In other words, 
what is the fare to get from point A to point B on the Ethereum network? The miners can choose to accept the gas or they may not. Generally, in the world of Ethereum, the higher the, the um, gas, the quicker your transaction will conclude. Now, we have another term called a fork. Now, a fork is essentially a what I would like to call more of a process, but it's really more than just a process. So think of a process as where you have miners and participants in a network who had consensus one day, but then don't have consensus another day, and they decide to split. Similar to a team that might have had 12 members, and then four decide to go their own way. They're still essentially running like Bitcoin, but instead of Bitcoin, it's called Bitcoin Cash now. That's where a fork really comes out of. Basically, it's a new blockchain basically coming off of the old blockchain network. So essentially, it's parallelism in its own right. Now we have some other terms. We have a ledger. This is an append-only record where records are immutable. Again, that's what a blockchain is about, immutability. Then a token. This is used for digital identity to basically validate that you own it. Tokenless ledger refers to a ledger that doesn't need a cryptocurrency to operate. Now, tokenless ledgers are used typically um, just to, um, you know, document small forms of validation. Like, for example, um, would be a tokenless ledger that's used for, like, certification validation could be a good example of one. But with that said, a token would be like Ether and then you may have a tokenless ledger built off of Ethereum, for example. A wallet is going to be a collection of private keys. This is essentially how you maintain your Bitcoins, your Litecoin, your Monero, whatever the cryptocurrency is. And this is going to be your private keys. If you lose that, you won't be able to access your Bitcoins or your Monero, whatever your cryptocurrency is. Very important. There's different types of wallets. We'll talk about that in the upcoming module, wallets. Now, Satoshi Nakamoto is a name used by this unknown person or persons. We don't know who really created Bitcoin, but he essentially designed the Bitcoin network and created its official implementation via a white paper in 2008. Bitcoin came on the market in 2009. We'll talk more about that in the Bitcoin module. Satoshi is a term. Basically, you can have one Bitcoin. Let's say at the time of writing, Bitcoin $6,500 per Bitcoin. It's similar to a dollar. And a dollar equals what? 100 pennies or 20 nickels or 10 dimes. Similar to that, the Satoshi is a unit of that cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. But it breaks down to 100 millionth of a single Bitcoin. So it's much greater dominations than, let's say, a dollar. An ICO is a term that's commonly used in the world of cryptocurrencies. And this is initial coin offering. This is creating a new token that you're going to sell. An ICO is similar to what you would have in the stock market world. An IPO works somewhat different, but in general, an ICO is launching a project to sell tokens and cryptocurrencies. Let's move on to the next module. Let's discuss the differences between blockchain and cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of confusion out there in the sense that 
a lot of the times are referred to as the same thing, but in reality, they're really two different things. One is the enabler and one is being enabled by the enabler. Let's go ahead and talk about it. Now, what is the difference? We want to think of digital currencies as secured through cryptography and also their role as a currency. They're mined, but not printed. They need a blockchain platform. Basically, you've heard of the term that Bitcoin is digital cold and silver is digital silver. But with that said, Bitcoin is definitely the most widely known and it is being enabled by blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Now, let's think of the blockchain as a book that can be written to but not erased. Blockchains can be private or public. They can be revolutionary when it comes to trust being implemented. Essentially, blockchain is the enabler for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the one that's being enabled by the blockchain. What's the difference? Well, essentially, we want to just confirm that we know that blockchain is the platform. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Dash need to have a blockchain platform. They need those peer-to-peer -peer nodes. They need those EVMs. We already know that blockchain is the enabler. Cryptocurrency uses the blockchain technology. We know that Bitcoin is the first known software token for blockchain. Basically, look at it as a perspective from the platform versus the application. The application is a cryptocurrency. The platform is the blockchain, the peer-to-peer -peer protocols. On the right side of the slide, we have our blockchain. That's our platform. Then we have the peer-to-peer -peer protocols. On top of the peer-to-peer -peer protocols, we then need to have some kind of an approach to pay for the shared services. You could think of it as a token that needs to be purchased to use the platform. The miners that are working the platform need to get compensated for the power and time and resources that they use. So let's review what the difference is. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol based cryptocurrency and it uses the peer-to-peer -peer platform which is a blockchain protocol based hardware consensus configuration. Ethereum is a platform for example and Ether is the cryptocurrency. In reality it's a token but it's considered a cryptocurrency because it's traded like wild. Okay, now let's sum it up. Let's go ahead and just look at one more scenario. The blockchain is like a train track. It's the platform. Cryptos are the train on the track. They're being enabled. That's the difference. So why is it commonly confused? that cryptocurrencies are blockchain and they can never have any enterprise use. Well, the reality is, is that there's still confusion and misinformation out there. The enterprises are seriously looking at the blockchain. Let's go ahead and move on. We have a lot to cover. Blockchain basics. Let's go ahead and discuss what a blockchain is. Now, you've likely seen over the last few years many different definitions and approaches to discussing or defining what a blockchain is. It's important to understand that blockchain technology is not really 
new technology in the sense that it's it's not based on technology that's brand new. It's really based on technology such as cryptography and databases that essentially have really just been implemented in a different manner. And also, too, you've been coding for a while. If you're a developer, if you have any programs out there that are written in Python or Golang or JavaScript, this is really all the blockchain is. It's, it's basically just another way to code. The reality is, is that from a technology perspective, there's nothing really new here. It's just the way the technology of blockchain has been portrayed to be complex or something new, when in reality, we've been running encryption for decades. We've been writing to databases for decades. And we've been coding for decades. Now, what makes blockchain so special or revolutionary is the fact of immutability, is the fact that you could have essentially a permissionless blockchain that is immutable, that is distributed, that is a proof of trust or root of trust. So let's review. Blockchain is really a cryptographically secured shared distributed ledger. It essentially is for immutable transactions that are written on the distributed ledger and the nodes. Now a node is going to be essentially Depending on the blockchain, let's say it's Bitcoin, a node is essentially a Bitcoin server that is essentially a node, and a node is going to be running basically the blockchain services on a virtual machine, and that's essentially what a node is. So these nodes are going to be distributed between different areas of the world in the Bitcoin world. Same thing with Ethereum. Now, things are very different in the corporate world where blockchains are going to be more centralized. We'll talk somewhat about that coming up, but that's more of an architecture core subject. But for this course, we just want you to know it's all about cryptography. It's about immutable transactions. It's transformational technology that companies and businesses, governments, etc., are investing in. And the reason they're investing in it is because of the fact that there's potential for cost savings, that there's potential in creating efficiencies or other benefits and the reality is that the benefits will vary greatly between different types of organizations lastly it's a decentralized database now decentralized database is going to be a distributed ledger this ledger will be distributed for all the nodes running the blockchain service for example if you're an ethereum miner you have your blockchain node running and you have a copy of the blockchain every node is going to have its own copy of the blockchain let's go ahead and talk about what you could think a blockchain is i like to compare a blockchain to a book and in that book we have pages and then every page entry Anytime something's written to that blockchain, it's considered a page entry. Essentially, it's a ledger entry. So think about a page entry in a book, a notebook, a ledger, 
as a blockchain transaction. Think of a blockchain as a book that can be written to but not erased. Blockchains can be private or they can be public. Blockchains such as Ethereum, Bitcoin, Monero, Komodo, these are all public blockchains. Private blockchains are going to be Hyperledger, anything in the Hyperledger family like Fabric or Sawtooth, or it could be R3 Quarter, for example, as well. Blockchains are revolutionary in the way that they implement trust. Now, trust is important to realize from a perspective of being able to believe in the code, in the technology. Now, let's think about a blockchain a little differently. Now, a blockchain is really, at its most technical level, a globally shared data structure. It's a transactional backend database. Bitcoin would call this a ledger, for example. In other words, if you have 1,600 nodes on the Ethereum blockchain, this means that every node can read entries in the database just because they're on the network. This is a permissionless blockchain, my friends. If you want to change something in the database, you then have to create a transaction. We have to allow this transaction to be accepted by everyone. In other words, consensus. Consensus occurs when all the nodes agree that this transaction is valid. When a transaction comes up, it implies that the change you want to make is either done or it's not done at all. It's, in other words, it's not completely applied. I like to compare a transaction to essentially logic in blockchain basically a transaction in blockchain is nothing but logic a zero or a one it either happens or it doesn't there's no you know in-betweens there's no partially correct answers that's the reality when we compare blockchains to other technologies think about the telecom network for example to a telephone. That telecom network is essentially a blockchain from a comparison perspective. And then the telephone needs a network to what? To be able to make calls. Think of a blockchain as the platform and then the cryptocurrencies or the smart contracts are essentially the telephone from a comparison perspective. Databases are centralized where the blockchain is decentralized. One of the challenges with blockchain technology is that there's no one person controlling it from a permissionless perspective. There is no centralized control. Blockchains are, of course, not new in the sense that there's new technologies. It's the sinking of these technologies. And then we could have public or private. Blockchains are built from peer-to-peer -peer networks, private key encryption, and programs. Now, digital identity is established with essentially a public key and a private key. The sender and the receiver need to have the appropriate keys to be able to have a blockchain transaction get committed to the ledger. Why is blockchain so revolutionary? Why are companies and enterprises talking about it, implementing plans, running assessments, proof of concepts? It's because it, it's all about 
the technology implementing trust. Trust is at the center and essentially removes intermediaries. It creates efficiencies. When you need to send money from point A to point B, let's say the U.S. to Peru, you generally need to go through an intermediary, such as Western Union, such as PayPal, such as your bank. And again, this causes challenges. Now, one of the other things we have to consider is that because there is no intermediaries in a blockchain, you send that transaction from point A to point B. And you don't need to have a bank or PayPal or Western Union or whoever you may use to approve and moderate that transaction. This is also essentially disruptive to the status quo. This is really challenging organizations that are intermediary heavy. This is a big deal. Platform, when, when you consider blockchains, these are platforms that could have numerous use cases. A lot of changes coming down the road. Now, when it comes to blockchains, just think about it from this perspective that blockchains really may be complex technology, but the concept is simple. It's all about trust. Blockchains are ledgers that are shared among computers around the world. When we go through the demos at the end of the course, you'll see with Ethereum and Bitcoin that essentially these nodes are distributed all over the world. The ledgers are mutable. In other words, you can write, but you can't delete. You can't update. You append to a blockchain. Blockchain is not new technology, but it is a sinking of technologies. Let's go over to the whiteboard and actually talk a little bit more and draw it out. Now, in the whiteboard here, what I'd like to do is just walk through how blocks are written in a blockchain and why it's so different than maybe what you've seen in a database. Generally, we want to think of a blockchain as essentially a group of nodes. And let me get a pen here. And these groups of nodes essentially are going to be called pools. When we talk about Ethereum and Bitcoin, generally you have mining pools. And it could be, you know, one miner having six or seven mining rigs, or you could have large corporate enterprises with miners. But what, whatever the situation is, these miners are racing to compete, to write to the blockchain. Now, when we consider our blockchain, what we want to consider is a few things here. And let me change the color back to red. So we have our first block. Our first block is going to be block zero. This is our Genesis block. The Genesis block is always going to start the blockchain off. And then when a transaction occurs, this block is going to be written. And just realize when this block is written here, it's appending the, to the blockchain. It's not deleting anything here. And when block three is written, guess what? 
It's basically appending. It's not deleting. It's not modifying. And then let's say another transaction comes in. Guess what happens? Block four is then appended to number three. And then another block comes in. Guess what? Block five. And this keeps on going and going and going. Whereas in a centralized database, you would typically be able to update and delete the records on the fly if you're the administrator. In a blockchain, nothing can be deleted. When it comes to realizing that you have your miners and each of these miners have a copy of the blockchain on it, every one of these miners' copies of the blockchain will then, guess what? It'll, they'll update the blockchain on each of the nodes and they'll have the same copy of the blockchain on each of these nodes. Now, this is where the consensus algorithms really come to play, especially when you have latency and other challenges like that. But just realize at a basic level, we'll go through some more transaction workflows in the upcoming chapter, and then the architecture course will go deeper into this. Just realize that a blockchain is immutable, that blocks are appended, they're not deleted, they're not updated. The miners have a copy of the consensus algorithms, essentially. This is your blockchain itself, and the ledgers are distributed between the nodes. So this is where the peer-to-peer -peer networking comes in. Remember, the blockchain is what? It's several things. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network, it's encryption, and it's smart contracts or technology. Now, one thing to note, we have a hashing demo. You'll see how the hash will be appended to the previous block and the previous block and, and how that's all applied down the blockchain. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next module. Let's talk about transactions in a blockchain network. When it comes to transactions, we want to understand that the term blockchain is derived from the way transactions are stored. Basically, you have blocks and chain, block chain. Those transactions are completed after that new block is added to the existing blockchain. In reality, when it's added, it's appended is really the term to use. Basically, it's a truth machine. Now, when it comes to transactions, basically it's appending that transaction and it's taking the hash of the previous uh, hash, for example, adding that to the transaction and it's creating this essentially flow of transactions that are documented. It's providing that providence of essentially immutability uh, as well. So a lot of benefits to this. For example, the way a transaction works at a high level is going to be, there has to be a request. A sender has to request to send, for example, Bitcoin. And that transaction will be sent out by the sender as a request. It'll be broadcast to the network. The miners ne then need to essentially mine that transaction to validate it's a good transaction. And there's a lot more to the consensus as well, but essentially it's going to validate, do some work. The miners are going to have to compete for this as well. There's rewards involved for them. And then it will combine the sender and receiver to uh, essentially the transaction, and it'll add those new blocks to the blockchain. And when, when I say add, it's really appending to the blockchain. And medium.com has a good article on how that works for those interested. When it comes to Bitcoin transactions, again, we know that it's immutable. All the transactions are going to be electronically recorded 
and will not be taken back. They can't be deleted. Immutability is really where the value comes in. Now, what is a block? A block is a container data structure, very simple. In Bitcoin, there's typically 500 transactions per uh, block, and it's going to contain a digital signature, a timestamp, and relative information. Depending on the blockchain, the block size could be 1 meg, 8 meg, 4 meg, 2 meg, for example. Bitcoin Cash, when they forked, they went to an 8 meg block size. When it comes to blocks, there's three sets of metadata that typically would be part of the block that it's going to keep track of. You have the previous block hash. Remember, every block is going to have the previous block, and that's important to know. From a mining competition, as I had stated earlier, the miners need to compete to be able to write to the blockchain. In other words, they want to package up transactions in a block and write it to the blockchain. In other words, they get rewarded based on that uh, ability to be first. It's like a marathon approach, for example, in Bitcoin. And then the next part is called a Merkle tree root. This is a data structure that summarizes the transactions. Let's take a look at what one looks like. Here's a good example of a Merkle tree. You have what's called the Genesis block. And the Genesis block is going to be essentially the root. This is the, the starting point of the blockchain. This structure is going to validate all the other transactions that happen based on the previous transactions. There's a lot of other little details that go into this as well. But for this course, we want to focus on the basics at a high level. What I'd like you to know is that a transaction occurs because there's a sender and a receiver. Second thing you may want to also realize is that there's miners involved that process the transactions in, in like the Bitcoin and Litecoin networks, also Ethereum. And then as far as the data structure for the blockchain, there's metadata that keeps track of that. And the Merkle tree is really going to be the verification of the blockchain. It's going to help identify the consistency and content of all the data starting back from day one. Let's move on. Now I'm over here at one of the Bitcoin block explorers. And what we want to do is just take a look at what you could find out in a blockchain explorer. And then we'll go take a look at the Genesis block for Bitcoin. Now, if we go over here, you could go and see that it has the hash rates available, tells you the major pools that are essentially running. It also tells you the network status. This is btc.com. There's several others out there um, as well you go to. There's plenty of stats here you can look at. Um, pool distribution, block size, the block version. Tells you the version of the blockchain that's been released. You could go over here to Ethereum if you want. There's tools as well. There's a mining profit calculator as well transaction decoding etc pool over here and you can join a pool if you so choose but let's go back to home and i just want to go show you the genesis block of bitcoin now what we want to do is go up to address here the genesis block of any blockchain is going to be typically zero so we put in zero we want to search for zero Now, this is going to come back, and it does come back. And if we remember what year Bitcoin started, it was 2009. You could see that the first Bitcoin was actually written to the blockchain in 2009, January 3rd at 1.15.05 p.m. Now, you could see here the block hash. This is the first hash that occurred. And notice that there's no previous block. Again, this is a Genesis block. This is the Merkle tree root that was started. This tells you the number of bytes, confirmation, transaction, etc. This tells you, again, that uh, 
this is the um, ID here of the transaction. No Bitcoin. This just basically initiated the blockchain, as you could see. And then again, you go over here and find out um, the next block, or actually the easiest way is go here to the next block and see the next transaction. And then you'll see the previous block hash listed here and the next block after that. So this is the way you could explore the transactions that have occurred. Again, the first few transactions on, on Bitcoin were more of a test for that matter. And then we go to the next block. and the next block and you can see that the Merkle tree will change and the previous block hash will change as well so on and so on and then after they're done testing you could see that uh, the um, you could see over here the fees again there isn't much going on initially but after Bitcoin gets started like when we go back to home we go and select um, one of these block heights over here, one of these transactions that were written. And let's take a look. This tells you the height, basically the difficulty rate. That's another discussion itself. Over here, you get to go ahead and see the Bitcoin and the time and date over here. So that was basically about a third of one Bitcoin. The value of that at the time of writing um, is about 3500 per Bitcoin and with that said it's probably about eleven twelve hundred dollars in that range somewhere in there with that said this is a blockchain explorer go to btc.com and look around now I'm over here at the anders.com blockchain hash uh, demo page this is a really cool website they've got an SHA 256 hash uh, demo page they have a block and a blockchain and uh, some other pages as well to look at now let's just briefly talk about what we're going to do here and why it's important in regards to uh, blockchain and encryption now generally a hash algorithm what it's going to do is take uh, that uh, data that I'm going to enter and put it um, ba basically into what's called a fixed length hash now what should happen is every time I enter the same data, I should result in getting the same data out. Now, when I modify the data by, let's say, one number or one letter, that'll totally change the hash. But basically, um, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, in general, hashing works pretty much the same. But, for example, in uh, Bitcoin, it uses an SHA-256 hashing algorithm, and it uses what's you know what's essentially random numbers that uh, that will generally um, allow the Ethereum uh, protocol to, um, to to use what's called a predictable amount of CPU effort, and that's why, for example, with like Ethereum or even Bitcoin. Um, they're able to estimate the cost of processing that transaction because of the fact the hashes, the, the signatures are, are steady. Uh, when you generate that uh, hash, uh, basically um, uh, this will, of course, provide a result that should be expected. So let's go ahead and give it a try. I'm going to go uh, hello Udemy. Okay. Now, if you look at the hash, you can see that uh, it, it's 903 and then it ends in 1219. Now, let me just change that by one digit. Let me go Udama. Now, you can see that that totally changed. Let's go ahead and put back the Y. And again, what do we have? That same exact hash ID. And when I add um, blockchain there, let's say, you can see that the hash... Uh, begins with a BA and ends in a 5E. Let's go ahead and take out an N. And you can see that that totally changes. And I take out another one that totally changes that hash. Let's go ahead and put in the IN. Now you can see it goes back to the BA and it goes to 5E again at the end. So, so just think of it from this perspective. 
the hashing algorithm was what essentially is going to take that input data and turn it into a fixed length hash because of the fact that hash will result in the same uh, data basically it won't uh, change uh, you know the output if it's the same data however if you change uh, the, I should say the input by one, then what happens, the output will be totally different. But basically, just like any um, compute data, uh, for example, they, these are going to be large numbers, and uh, typically, too, it's going to be written in um, down here. You can see it's hexadecimal. So with that said, just, uh, just be aware of how SHA-256 works and just have a good understanding. It's fairly simplistic. Now let's go over here to block. Now you could see when I go to block, I have a hash already there. There's a, a block ID of one. If I take out that block ID and I add in like, uh, let's say 33, you can see that it starts with 71 and it has an F3. And then let's go ahead and change it to 31. And you can see that it ends in 67 and then I change it back to 33 to see that there's F3 again. Now, let's enter some data. And you can see that when I go hello uh, world, it ends in 9.4. And then I take out the D, as expected, it changes back. And now what I could do is if I go here to mine, what's going to happen is it's going to go ahead and essentially, uh, what this is doing is representing essentially writing to the blockchain. And so what's going to happen is it's going to take the previous hash, basically, and um, uh, you, know, you know make sure it's aware of that. And you can see that the block ID is 33, and the nonce that was chosen, remember the nonce is a random number that's chosen. And uh, again, you can see that that's how that changes. Now, what about if I change the nonce? You can see that the hash changes as well. I change it back to 5. Guess what? I get the same hash. Now, let's go over to blockchain. Now you could see this actually happen um, in sort of a workflow. Now I have block one, block two, and block three. You can see the nonces are totally different, and there's no data. What I want to do is I want to go uh, hello Udemy, and you can see that my hash uh, is a D7 and it ends in AB. Now you can see that the previous hash, what's it represent? D7 ends in AB. What's this hash here? So basically it's referencing the previous hash. And then this one here, what's it doing? This, this hash here is being referenced by the third block. And if I go, hello, Udemy, what happens? Basically the hash changes again. And again, block ID, different nonce. So this is a really cool tool to play around with, just to give yourself an idea. And again, if you go down the line, you'll see that uh, it's going to reference the previous hashes. So this is uh, called anders.com uh, blockchain slash blockchain.html. The link is in resources. Uh, give it a try, just so you have a good idea of how things work. Now let's talk about the components to a blockchain. When it comes to components, it's important to understand what a blockchain is. We understand that it's a ledger, it's a distributed ledger, and these nodes could be distributed among the world. Once again, th this is a ledger, it's immutable, it's distributed. We already know that from the review. Now let's talk about the key components in a blockchain. We need to have cryptography. We need a peer-to-peer -peer network. In other words, we need to be able to securely send our data, and cryptography will help enable that. A peer-to-peer -peer network is going to use protocols such as a gossip protocol, or gossip protocol, essentially, that is going to allow us to communicate directly with other peers without going through a client-server application. That ledger will be shared. In other words, all the other participants on the blockchain will be able to see this ledger and write to it and view it, for example. There needs to be some kind of method to reach an agreement. Consensus is very important. Validity rules. How do you validate that the transaction is actually valid? In other words, in the world of 
cryptocurrencies, you have a concern over what's called double spending. Is it possible someone could hack the blockchain and allow double spending? In other words, like in the banking world, you have what's called overdraft. You don't want to overdraft a wallet in the blockchain world. And then you need to have some way of running the blockchain. And you need to distribute this blockchain service on a virtual machine. Now, it could be on a virtual machine or a container. Most enterprise blockchains typically run on a container uh, such as a Docker container. However, a lot of the cryptocurrencies still use virtual machines such as Ethereum and Bitcoin. When it comes to cryptography, we need to ensure that we can record, encrypt, and communicate between the peers in a blockchain. This, of course, removes the ability to be managed by a central authority. Now, the peer-to-peer -peer network we know is going to allow us to communicate between peers on the network. We don't have to go through an uh, intermediary to talk to another client or peer. In other words, the nodes are participating on the blockchain. All, of course, can communicate between each other. The workloads are shared. In other words, when the processing um, requirements step up, the essentially the transactions are coming in, all the blockchain nodes are going to participate in that transaction. That's part of the consensus um, implementation generally as well. Now the ledger is a data structure. We know that. We know that it's going to be immutable. We also know that each of the nodes participating in this network have a copy of the blockchain. And consensus is going to be implemented to ensure that the nodes can come to an agreement. Another term that's commonly used is a world state. How does the blockchain look at a specific point in time? What is the transaction block height? What is the position in the Merkle tree? What is the hash? When it comes to validity, we need to have rules that determine how transactions are going to be validated. This is from ethereum.org. This is a good diagram over how Ethereum essentially provides validity and consensus and how a transaction overall is actually processed. And then when it comes to virtual machines, Ethereum, for example, just like Bitcoin, has a, a virtual machine. Ethereum calls it an EVM. This is a Turin complete virtual machine, essentially, uh, a state-based virtual machine. There's a lot of discussion over, you know, is it a Turing complete or semi-Turing complete? Again, the argument's up in the air on that, but in reality, it's really semi. It doesn't fully comply in some respects. But with that said, just for this course, we want you to know that the blockchain nodes requires a virtual machine to run the blockchain. Just like in the demos coming up, I'll walk you through Litecoin and how you could download the blockchain locally and have your wallet locally and download a copy of the blockchain to your laptop or computer. It's essentially a full node and that's going to have a virtual machine running on your desktop. With that said, let's move on to the next module. Hello, folks. Let's go ahead and talk about consensus and mining. Now, when it comes to mining and blockchains, uh, for example, Bitcoin um, basically uses mining essentially as a way to solve problems, to validate the transactions, essentially. And it has a ledger and, of course, it's updated when uh, the nodes solve the problem. I like to compare this to like running a marathon. But basically, you know, the blockchain is really uh, used in a different manner than a lot of other blockchains, especially when you have a proof of work mining algorithm. Now, when it comes to mining, uh, it's pretty similar at a high level to, uh, to, to what you might do with like looking for copper or for coal. And so if you're mining for copper or coal, you're using large 
uh, resources, you know, really intense resources typically that use a lot of energy to dig up the ground to find these resources. Now, when it comes to, to mining, for example, Bitcoin, uh, you have these very large, powerful nodes uh, that, uh, that use a ton of compute power. And it uses basically a lot of, uh, you know, computer uh, intensive uh, ASIC, you know, really specific uh, uh, operations to be able to uh, to, to solve these uh, problems. So, uh, for example, Bitcoin uses what's called the hash cache proof of work algorithm. Now, the way it works is generally uh, the miners, the nodes that that have the large, intense processing capabilities that are, you know, uh, part of the blockchain for Bitcoin, for example, basically, and this is true with Ethereum and Litecoin, for example, as well, but basically you have the nodes that are competing to, uh, to get a reward. And this reward is given when uh, that uh, block is discovered. And when it says discovered, basically, it, it really means at a high or actually at a mid-level that the block is, is valid. In other words, the, the, the problem uh, of trying to go through, um, uh, you know, this competition to solve the problem, basically, this problem has been solved. And so this node gets an award for solving uh, the problem. And there has to be consensus among all the other nodes as well to be able to get this reward. Now, the bounty uh, right now is 25 Bitcoins. And uh, basically, this gets halved uh, about every 210,000 blocks uh, on the Bitcoin uh, network. Now, when I do my demos, I'm going to go through how you could explore the blockchain with Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, as well. But just uh, just be aware that you could certainly find out the number of blocks, what block number the transaction uh, occurred at, uh, for example, the date and time. The miner is also awarded uh, fees that are paid by the user to send the transaction as well. And the fee is an incentive uh, for... Uh, the miners that participate in the transaction to actually include it in the block uh, when it's written to the blockchain. Now, when you're writing a block to the blockchain, it's it's typically not one block. It's going to be, you know, a one transaction, I should say. It's usually a group of transactions, depending on how many transactions, you know, they could squeeze into, um, you know, the amount of... Uh, you know, space that they can um, utilize um, in the blockchain. Now, Bitcoin is limited to essentially one meg, so you don't really have a lot of space, even though you, you have Bitcoin Cash, which has a, a higher uh, amount of uh, uh, stored space. But in this case, let's say with Bitcoin, again, you know, you have uh, some challenges like multi-sig and uh, Segwit that that have uh, gone on in the past, but uh, we're not really going to focus on Bitcoin so much for this course. But I, it's important to compare Bitcoin to how other blockchains operate. Now let's talk about algorithms. Now, when it comes to consensus, basically this is the algorithms that are utilized. Now, each of the blockchains, such as uh, Litecoin versus Dash versus Hyperledger versus Ethereum versus uh, Corda, they all utilize typically a different uh, consensus algorithm. Now, you may have uh, Bitcoin and Litecoin, for example. They both use proof of work. However, they utilize a different version of the proof of work algorithm. And Dash, for example, is really a hybrid of proof of work and proof of stake, for example. And then we talk about Byzantine fault tolerance, uh, a version of that when we look at some of the Hyperledger solutions that are out there as well. And then Steemit 
for example, uses more of a delegated proof of stake. But we'll talk more about these here in a second. Now, proof of work was the first blockchain consensus algorithm. Satoshi Nakamoto created it for the blockchain uh, for Bitcoin. Basically, the proof of work algorithm, uh, the miners have to solve problems to create blocks. Now, proof of work runs on a system of the longest chain wins. Basically, who, whoever is able to solve the problem first and create uh, uh, the longest chain, essentially, of blocks, wins uh, the contest. Now, the downside of this algorithm is that it's very cost costly from... Uh, from a resource perspective, not just environmentally, like power and cooling, but it's also very expensive from, you know, going out and buying a mining rig. Uh, so it's, you need to really have the high-end uh, processors with the ASICs. Uh, uh, even GPUs are really um, sort of outdated now. You can't just use like, a, you know, typical computer now. Uh, with a processor, you need to have uh, really high-end uh, uh, mathematical uh, focused, uh, actually mathematically uh, focused, intense powering capacity. And that's what the ASICs are really used for, is to really focus on running uh, those problems as quickly and efficiently as possible. Now, proof of stake is different uh, because of the fact that you don't have, per se, uh, miners. Uh, basically, you have what's called a minter. This is where you have basically an investment, per se, from a financial perspective, typically. And this is where you also could bet on what blocks are valid. So, for example... If you have, let's say, Dash, Dash uses a hybrid of this, but it's sort of a, a good example. If you want to participate in the Dash blockchain uh, as, a, as a node, you have to put up a certain amount of uh, Dash and keep it in reserve, like in re escrow. In the case of... Uh, a fork, minters basically can uh, vote on whether or not they want to support that fork. Uh, that fork, I mean. Now, that fork, when I say fork, what that really means is basically you have some mining nodes, the owners of that nodes basically you know, state, I don't want to do an upgrade. And therefore, we're going to just stay the same. But you may have a lot of mining interest per se, or minting interest if it's proof of stake, that basically say, hey, you know, we we just upgraded. We're not really um, bringing in what we would expect. Let's go ahead and create another blockchain, basically. And that's typically a fork. Good examples of that would be um, uh, Litecoin, Litecoin Cash, uh, Ethereum, Ethereum Cash, so on and so on. Now, the attacks can be costly, but they're more environmentally friendly, at least from a, uh, a mining or proof of stake perspective. Then we have what's called DPoS. This is the delegated proof of stake. Now, this is an interesting one where miners typically uh, work together, where typically in proof of stake or actually proof of work, the miners are individual. They're just working as individuals, and it's like a race. Whereas in um, DPoS, it's a little different where the miners work together. And so basically, this is an approach to where you can um, uh, be able to combine that compute power and uh, be able to uh, use that power more efficiently. It is a cheaper approach, but it is you know, centralized. And that's that's one of the founding factors of a blockchain and a cryptocurrency is that you want it to be decentralized. However, you know, it's, it's a hybrid approach in some respects. And uh, examples of that would be Steemit and EOS uh, are good examples. And then we have what's called Byzantine fault tolerance. 
Now, this is the classic issue where um, you would have, uh, to, you know, basically when, when it says generals, uh, basically a general will be a leader of the blockchain. Now, it's very similar to from a history perspective, if you're familiar with like uh, uh, war and, and all that. You would have like generals surrounding like a castle or a fort or a city or whatever. And before communications came about, you know, from like a radio perspective, one of the challenges was really around um, how do we communicate between all the generals that are surrounding the city and how do we communicate to them uh, to go ahead and attack at this specific time? What could happen, though, is if they sent a messenger out, that messenger could get um, kidnapped or, you know, held hostage. The message could get stolen. Uh, and so if you have, let's say, three generals and only one gets the message and the other two don't, then that city may not uh, be taken by those generals. And so in computer science, it's pretty similar uh, in the sense that you have distributed com computing. And because of that, um, you know, there isn't really a, a way to um, delegate authority between all these nodes. So basically, you could use um, different part, you know, different algorithms of VFT, uh, for example, to accomplish higher throughput, higher transaction rates. Some of those examples would be Hyperledger, Ripple, and Stellar. Uh, typically, use a uh, a version of BFT. And then there's also another approach called DAGs. DAGs are directed acyclic graphs, and and they're known as DAGs. But basically, um, it's it's really an interesting approach in the sense that. Uh, it doesn't actually utilize the blockchain per se. And what it does uh, is it really um, communicates between like all the nodes essentially in a manner that doesn't actually write to the blockchain. It, it's more of a, um, a sort of a loop approach, I guess, is the way to look at it, where it goes back and forth um, directly. It's like a peer-to-peer -peer approach, but it doesn't per se, utilize the blockchain data structure uh, effectively. And one more note about DAGs, too, is they really do solve a problem not only around like how typically, let's say, a proof-of-work system would work, because generally you can't create blocks uh, simul you know, simultaneously, essentially, like in Bitcoin. But with the DAG approach, it uses that data structure for typically what's called a uh, topography ordering approach. And basically, it's, it's a way to order the sequence uh, of, uh, of the, the processing of the blocks. And, and basically, it performs a lot of other things in the background, like uh, scheduling and, and routing, and it uses data compression. Uh, but... Uh, but again, this is a unique approach. It's it's really, uh, I wouldn't really call it per se a blockchain approach. It's more of a, uh, a distributed uh, approach, you know, that uses what's called a graph data structure. So, so it's really unique, but it is utilized in some of the blockchains. And it's important to note that one is IOTA and the other is Hashgraph as well. Blockchain ledgers. Let's discuss what exactly a blockchain ledger is and how they work. Essentially, we have to understand that in a blockchain, we have what's called consensus. Consensus is where the ledger, which is distributed, again, between all the nodes on the network, will maintain their own copy of the ledger. So think about it as you storing files on your computer and then you might be in a network of 10 other computers, let's say, and those other 10 computers have a copy of your data as well. So it's like taking almost like a, 
a backup or a snapshot of your data and maintaining it or replicating it is another way to look at it. This architecture allows for a new capacity of record keeping that goes beyond a simple database. Now, traditionally centralized systems were generally controlled by, you know, a person or a group of folks and a team, whatever that scenario is. And they were in control of the database. They could modify it, delete it, adjust it however they want. Now, generally, this was generally the way IT was done. Now, with blockchain, this is changing the way of allowing trust to be at the center and removing those intermediaries. A ledger is an append-only record store. This is where the records are immutable. In other words, it can't be deleted and generally can have more information than financial records. So think of a blockchain as not just a cryptocurrency platform, but it can also be utilized for transferring real estate or tracking activity from like farm to table, for example. Customs declarations, you name it. There's a lot of great use cases we'll talk about. A distributed ledger is different in the sense that it's still a ledger, but that ledger is going to be distributed between all the nodes on a blockchain, on the blockchain network specifically. It's decentralized and all the nodes have a copy. A distributed ledger is a database that is stored and updated independently by each node in the blockchain as we know. Basically, what makes it unique is the decentralized and distributed nature of it. The blockchain is immutable, and once again, when there's an update to the transaction, every other node will get a copy of that transaction. That's part of the consensus mechanism. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's go ahead and talk about what Ethereum is and why it's important to, to know essentially as an enterprise blockchain architect, pre-sales engineer, technologist, analyst, whatever your uh, title is. But Ethereum is pretty much the big boy when it comes to uh, the blockchains out there and it's a platform that's very widely used and has numerous use cases. Let's go ahead and talk about it. Now, Ethereum, uh, basically was a platform that was designed uh, in 2014. And the, the creators of Ethereum basically saw the need to have some way to support the platform. And to do that, they needed to have some kind of tokens or cryptocurrency basically to do that. So as with any ICO, there is basically a pre-sale offering. And generally as well, there's some set-asides for the founders and the contributors as well. But some things to know is that when, uh, for example, when a block's created, five ethers are created um, by every block, which is about every 15 seconds uh, to... Uh, the uh, miner of that block. Two to three ethers may also be sent to another miner, such as an uncle. An uncle is basically someone that uh, didn't uh, actually win the transaction, but contributed to it, uh, for example. Now, Ethereum uh, is the most widely used open source blockchain uh, platform. It's basically a distributed computing application platform. Uh, it was uh, initiated by Vitalik Buterin in 2014, uh, 2013, but they uh, sort of went more ICO in 2014, and then they officially launched in 2015, which was uh, the production blockchain was July 30th, 2015. Basically, you're going to use Ethereum, and your customers are going to use Ethereum to deploy uh, what's called smart contract functionality. 
it's basically going to allow your customers to um, create programs uh, as well that combine a collection of smart contracts uh, called DOPS. Now, you could also deploy an Ethereum, uh, what's called the DAO, basically a, a decentralized autonomous organization as well. Now, the Ethereum platform uses what's called a uh, EVM. This is the Ethereum virtual machine. It is basically a decentralized virtual machine. And on that uh, EVM, which is also known as a node, uh, it's going to contain essentially the ledger, the blockchain, and uh, the smart contract functionality as well. Now, a quick refresher, uh, some of this is redundant from the blockchain terms, but remember, Ethereum uses a token called Ether. And Ethereum is actually the platform. There's typically a lot of confusion out there between Ether and Ethereum, and they're really two different things. So Ethereum is a platform, Ether is a token, uh, essentially. Now, Ethereum has four main components to it. The platform has nodes. It has uh, Ethereum virtual machines, smart contracts, and it has dApps, decentralized apps. Now, on the nodes, essentially, would be the, uh, you know, the, the virtual machines, basically. The distributed ledger will be located on those. And, you know, on top of that would be the EVMs. And then you have smart contracts and then dApps, as well as another layer. Uh, and, of course, all this connect is connected to the Internet. So you could have nodes uh, in every country in the world. Uh, again, one of the factors uh, with Ethereum is if you have 16,000 nodes, uh, that blockchain isn't really considered to be in a correct state until all the nodes are updated. Now, the EVM, uh, again, a refresher from some of the terms we covered, basically is software that's running the Ethereum protocol. Uh, this is what actually executes those smart contracts, uh, or dApps, essentially. And with Ethereum, everything's pretty much written in Solidity. Uh, there is some flexibility, though, uh, with the newer uh, uh, releases that are coming out to develop in other languages. But Solidity is really the uh, language that's typically used. And again, the code uh, is going to typically uh, be uh, written in what? Uh, solidity. Uh, the code as well is going to be associated with an account uh, as well. And this account is what's actually going to read and write to storage and then send messages as well. So each of the EVMs are going to have code running on it. And then there's accounts that are essentially what? Connected to the blockchain that are processing transactions. Some other terms, gas, right? For you, uh, let's say as an organization to participate in the Ethereum blockchain, uh, you need to have uh, tokens. And those tokens are called what? Ether. But because of the fact that the tokens are cryptocurrency, right? Goes up and down in price all the time and fluctuates. The founders uh, of Ethereum, the developers, came up with an ingenious way to help um, keep uh, the costing steady and, and based um, you, you know, on an approach that uh, you could help determine what the actual, uh, I guess, expenditure is a good way to look at it, uh, would cost. So, for example, every time you write to the blockchain, that is going to require some kind of uh, cost paid to um, the miners to the nodes, right? Uh, now, the blockchain itself is a transaction-based state machine. Basically, this means that when there is an input that's read, those inputs are going to typically transition uh, that uh, state machine to a new state. Also, another term to know is called the genesis state. This is the beginning state uh, and then to the final state, right? So the genesis is really the beginning of the blockchain and then the transitions over time 
to the final state, essentially, after the, the blocks are written to the blockchain. Now, with Ethereum, for a transaction to be considered valid, uh, it is uh, processed by a validation process known as blockchain mining. Now, mining is when a group of nodes uses their compute power to validate that the transaction is actually correct. Now, this is really more of an overview of Ethereum, just at a high level. Um, Ethereum, to properly learn Ethereum, is at least uh, at least a one-day class, if not two days. Uh, developer courses are typically three days uh, in most cases. But the main point of view I want you to understand about Ethereum is that it is a permissionless base blockchain. It's the most widely used blockchain out there. And uh, it uses uh, tokens that are called Ether. And these tokens are what enables the Ethereum blockchain to uh, work and pay its miners. And then you have what gas, that's a measurement of what? The amount of essentially uh, work that needs to be done to process this, uh, this uh, work that is being requested by a smart contract, basically. So let's proceed on to the next module. I do have some demos around Ethereum uh, coming up. Please do stay for that as well in the demo section of the course. In this solution, we're going to go ahead and walk you through what MetaMask is, what it's useful for, how to uh, download it, how to sign into MetaMask, and discuss some areas around MetaMask that I think are, you know, really, I guess, interesting, even to probably an architect or a sales engineer. We're not going to focus on development. Uh, again, that's a whole different subject area, but we want to give you an idea of some of the tools out there so you could see how things are being applied and what your customers may be interested in, for example. Now, one of the areas that I think is really, really useful, especially with Ethereum, is you have what's called MetaMask. Now, MetaMask allows developers to basically communicate with um, web apps that are not blockchain apps, but also allows developers to run an Ethereum node without actually downloading that full Ethereum node. Now, if you go over here, you could see that uh, the, the fox, of course, moves around. That's pretty cool. This explains what it is. It's essentially a bridge. It allows you to go to um, uh, different parts of the web with your browser to run that dApp in your browser without that full Ethereum node. It includes a vault. Uh, it includes, um, you know, uh, the ability to sign for those transactions. There's a nice little intro here I'd recommend you look at. And you go over here, you go get the Chrome extension. So you click there. And this would be the extension. I already have it installed. And you can see if I click here, there's MetaMask. Now, that's, that's for Chrome. Now, if you don't want to use Chrome, they do have what's called the Brave Browser. And you'd have to download the, the browser as well if you didn't want to um, use the Chrome extension. So that's re really the only two options at this point. It is actually a very fast browser. So if you want to uh, look at that, you could download that. But let's go ahead and look at MetaMask. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and log in. 
I've already you know created my account and I also created what's called the seed phrase before I log in let me show you so you have this wallet seed uh, phrase and this could be anything that you enter like you know I went to Peru in August and I went salsa dancing whatever you want to put or you could put anything as simple or as complex as you want and then you put in a password and you confirm it so the passphrase and the password add that multi-factor capability but you don't want to lose it that's for sure so you put in your password here and uh, that's assuming you put in the right password and let me try it again there it is okay now I log in you could see that this this wallet I have called ether Joe now I have approximately looks like uh, $10 or so $9.43 um, and ether must have dropped since I sent it just because I know it's over $10 and now it's down to $9 anyways very trivial amount but just here to walk you through a demo now this is again what's in the account now I could go here and I could go to coinbase or shapeshift and basically it says if I want to go to shapeshift basically the exchange rate here you you put in your Bitcoin address here and you could transfer Bitcoin to get ether that's assuming you have Bitcoin if you don't if you're in the US you go to coinbase I don't believe they're accepting accounts from out of the US at one time they weren't but they may now so you may want to double check so you go over here and you put in you know whatever you want to put in twelve dollars ten dollars and you just put in your email and you just transfer it to uh, MetaMask now in this case here um, I already have uh, funds there to, to play around with now what you could do is go over here and I select um, ether Joe I could go ahead and view the account on ether scan now ether scan is the blockchain this is basically showing you the transactions that this this wallet performed I have the ability you can see that the ether value is nine dollars and forty five cents there's one transaction um, now what I'll do is I go ahead and send another transaction and then we'll go back and check that now if I go back here to uh, MetaMask I could also um, go over here and put in a gas limit and a gas price of what I'm willing to pay for a transaction now if I go up here you could see that I'm on the main Ethereum network now what about if I don't want to be on the Ethereum network and I want to be on a test network now there's different test networks that serve different purposes you also have the local host and also you create a custom RPC when it comes to the different test networks and custom RPCs now for example um, let's go back to this menu here and if I go down like for example there's Ropesten and there's Coven and Rinkaby now generally you want to use the appropriate test net for what you're trying to accomplish for example if you do an early stage contract development you may want to look at uh, the Rinkerby or a local host um, Ropsten is really um, focused for la latter stage contract development uh, this is a very popular test net uh, and again um, you have the ability for example with Ropsten to um, use the Ethereum network with free ether but it has poor security so when you connect to Robston, just remember that um, the um, the process is essentially using Geth, and it's you know simulates the Ethereum network and essentially allows you to test out that uh, that con contract. 
Now, the reason you may want to use a lightweight versus a heavyweight test net, so for example, um, you know, Rinker B. Coven, Ropestein, you know, use Ropestein if you're really uh, in that uh, late stage dev. Uh, the, the problem with it is that it's slower, generally, but the reliability could be good. So again, use the appropriate test net. Your developers are going to be pretty good at figuring that out, but you, you want to have an idea to talk intelligently about maybe why you need to use one of, over the other, right? Now, if I go back here, I could go and uh, send, and I put in the recipient address and the amount, and bingo. So I just sent a... Um, another uh, Ethereum uh, request to my wallet here. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Ether scan and see if it has been received. I don't see it shown here, but sometimes there is a little bit of a delay. And as you can see, I sent uh, $10 worth of uh, Ethereum to my wallet address so let's go ahead and check to see if it has been received in ether stats what we want to do is go over here and go over to the main area here you can see nothing's been updated yet that's okay i could go over here go to etherscan and you could see that eight seconds ago there is a transaction that was uh, pending now this again i've seen it take 10 minutes or so to update to metamask and let's go back here and what we could do just log out sometimes it's it's quicker just to log out than wait for it to happen okay and you could see that it did did update to $19 so it did uh, did update finally and um, that's good. So that's simply how MetaMask works and how you could use it as a wallet, but also as a browser all at the same time. Let's go ahead and talk about what a smart contract is. This is a term that's frequently used in the blockchain world, and it provides some really good insight into how blockchain is utilized and a smart contract is different in the sense where in the cryptocurrency world you have your cryptocurrencies however a smart contract is actually used in a manner to fulfill it's it's basically essentially a source of logic for whatever process you're trying to automate essentially for example if you're going to go ahead and purchase a house you could have a smart contract that is going to validate the the deed or the title of the home and then when the buyer provides the the funds at closing that smart contract will then initiate and then complete execute essentially if the requirements are fulfilled in other words it's basically logic in the sense that is is the funds there that are correct if it is, go ahead and do a one, you know, basically execute, uh, which would be like a one. And if the funds are not there, do not execute, it would be like a zero. Basically, it's an automated process. This is basically computer code. Now, smart contracts essentially are not, first of all, smart, and secondly, are not contracts. And this is where a lot of confusion comes into, I think, in the industry. 
because when they're first designed, they're not really meant to be a contract where in the sense that you would have two parties involved agreeing to sp specific terms. This is more of an automated approach to where if a condition's met, the contract will execute. They do provide significant value in the sense that there's autonomy, trust, backup, safety, speed, savings, and accuracy. Essentially, in the sense that you can execute a snippet of code, essentially, to either initiate a process that will kick off additional processes. Usually smart contracts are not singular in the sense that there's only one smart contract. Usually you have what's called a distributed app, and that's going to be a collection of different contracts. Now, as part of the smart contract in the blockchain world, basically there's trust in the sense that the code is going to do what it's supposed to do. In other words, you're not relying on manual processes. Now, when it comes to backup, what that's saying is this, is because it's on a blockchain network, the copy of those smart contracts and the transactions that are a result of that smart contract executing is actually backed up on all the other nodes in the blockchain. Safety in the sense that it's either all or nothing, but also it's immutable. In other words, once that's written to the blockchain, it's written to the blockchain. It's fast in the sense that there's no manual processes. There's, there's definitely possibilities for cost savings. And because you reduce manual tasks, the accuracy is, is generally a lot better because, again, you can't make mistakes if you're computer code. Now this is comparing a contract versus a smart contract. You can see that a traditional contract as compared to a smart contract has some significant differences. Uh, with this said, this is more of a generalization. Depending on how you implement your smart contracts, the jurisdiction you're in, the blockchain platform you're using. For example, Corda has what's called Core D apps, and as part of the, the smart contracts being implemented as part of a Core D app, Corda implements and has written into its functionality what's called legal prose. And this this essentially allows both parties to agree on certain terms ahead of time. And that's called legal prose. It's sort of built in. And that there could be actually legally enforceable in some jurisdictions. Smart contracts define rules and penalties around an agreement similar to a contract. Basically, the rules are you're going to send the funds on time. We're going to execute. If you don't send the funds on time, we won't execute. Now, penalties could be written in there if you're late as well. Again, this is all done as part of a distributed app. There could be enforcement ob obligations as part of that. And when you have several smart contracts, that's called a D app. Now, smart contracts from a coding perspective have two functions. One's a constructor function. One is a fallback function. Basically, the constructor function is called once. This is like the initialization process. And the fallback function is basically where the function essentially will be invoked to basically try to perform a task but cannot. These are the two functions that are mandatory in a smart contract generally. There could be additional functions added in, but those are the typical default ones. Smart contracts provide security that is better than traditional contracts. They can cut costs. Smart contracts that are on the Ethereum network run on the EVM. And the decentralized apps are basically going to be smart contracts. These are complex smart contracts. Generally, smart contracts two or more make up a distributed app. 
Now, once again, you can have hundreds of smart contracts being part of a distributed app. When it comes to enforcement, when it comes to Ethereum, for example, specifically, Ethereum states that all mods to a contract's data must be performed by the code. In other words, you can't go in there as a user and modify it. You've got to go ahead and uh, do this via a smart contract. And as part of this, the, the data that is being used has to actually process the kickoff and determine how to complete those requests. This is similar to basically enforce stored procedures in the, the centralized database world. Think of this as predefined rules. Essentially what this slide is saying is with Ethereum, manually you can't modify the smart contract. You've got to write your code and then basically compile that smart contract. When it comes to enforcements, from a legal perspective, they're generally not legally enforceable, especially if you go across borders or jurisdictions. They definitely could be used as evidence. Um, it's very common to compare a smart contract to like a vending machine. If you put in, you know, whatever it costs for that tonic or Coke, and let's say it's $2, you put in $2 and you don't get that Coke, then from a perspective, you're still you know, really deserving of a refund. However, once again, you know, it could be enforceable that you get your money back in a vending machine, but would it be worth your effort? Who really knows? Now, when it comes to a smart contract, here's an example. You have your functions, and you could see over on the left here, you have functions over here but as part of that you have your address so the address is going to be your ethereum wallet address the balance is the amount of ethers in that wallet the code is going to be the smart contract and then the state of the code is going to be the state of the smart contract essentially now how does this all work basically what you need to do is predefine the contract develop the code just like this, if this happens, do this, so on and so on, and then execute. Events are triggers, so basically the smart contract is reacting to a trigger. I like to compare this part to like a webhook. For anyone that's developed any kind of web sites in the past, you know that if someone visits those site, you could have it pop up a chat box, you could have it send you an email, whatever that scenario is. That's like a webhook. It's going to trigger based on a specific input or, or result. Execute and validate. This is where essentially you're going to either meet the contract terms or you're not. If the contract terms are met, then the value will be transferred. In other words, funds from this wallet will be sent over to the receiving wallet. And then settlement will happen. That's when the conditions have been met, the funds have been transferred, and then it's written to the blockchain, essentially. Let's go ahead and move on to the next module. I'm over here at the IBM Cloud website. What I'd like to do is walk through a demo of some of the functions and capabilities of the IBM blockchain as a service. So let's go over here to uh, blockchain. And uh, you can see it pops up blockchain there. And it's going to bring up a service name and um, location as well. But before we get into the uh, capabilities and spin up uh, some peers, for example, and install chain code. Let's uh, go over here for those folks that do not have an account yet. Now there is a starter membership plan. You get a credit of $500 to use towards your network. And what you wanna do 
is sign up for this if you do want to play around with the blockchain as a service. Um, I will say that there's two subscription models and there is a cost to maintain a membership uh, from a month-to-month -month perspective. So you need to pay attention for this. I would recommend if your company doesn't pay this, then what you want to do, uh, that is pay for the subscription, is essentially use a free trial for 30 days and then cancel the account so you're not charged the $200 a month um, for the starter membership. So let's go back to um, this page here, the main page. If we scroll down, you'll see that it has the pricing plans. This is where you get your $500 credit. This is good for you to develop on, to test, to um, to create your peers, your nodes, to, to get a real feature capability of the service. The cost is $250 per month, and then every peer that you have spun up is that. So this is still going to cost some money. So pay attention to what you're using um, if you don't want to um, have the subscription. The enterprise plan is $1,000 per month. Um, again, if you're not going to deploy um, an enterprise application that's using blockchain with Hyperledger, then you probably don't want to use this. Um, it's going to be pretty expensive. Now, the main difference between the starter plan and the enterprise plan is the fact that there's fault tolerance um, put in there. And then you also have a HSM ma manual that you could, um, uh, HSM module, I should say that you have the ability to utilize. So you want to select the starter membership. After you get your account, it'll go ahead and um, allow you to uh, create a blockchain instance. Now I want to point out too that the region and location to deploy in, Dallas is usually the default location for the uh, starter plan. And then the other locations like Sydney, um, Frankfurt, and London, um, you could see that uh, it's uh, regulated um, to typically, um, if you're using the starter plan, you're going to be regulated to uh, Dallas. Just be aware of that. Now, if I choose the um, enterprise plan, for example, I will then have, um, you know, some more choices if I so choose as well. But anyways, I'm going to uh, just go ahead and get started here. I'm going to go select create. This will take uh, about a minute. A lot of it just depends on the latency and the amount of activity uh, on the uh, service. Could be your network latency, whatever that is. Now, this came up pretty quick. It is loading. And what has just occurred is that it just created a blockchain network for me to start loading my chain code. And it deploys two organizations. And actually, this picture here is actually pretty, um, pretty valid. What it's doing is it's created two organizations. Organization 1 and Organization 2 with the peer and a CA as well as um, a uh, MSP as well. Uh, with that said, let's go and get started. We'll go ahead and select launch. When we first um, log in and start the service, it's going to give us the opportunity to learn more about the platform. There's a video, sample apps are here, and instructions on how to proceed is there. I'm going to go ahead and get out of that. Now, you could see that it deployed. Um, one thing to point out here is um, to uh, pay attention to the organization that you're in. Now, the organization I have is Org1, but if I go here, I could select Org2 as well. And you can see that it pops up. You can see that it says Org2 here. I'm going to go back to Org1. And you could see that the orderer um, and the org one peer is there. What I want to do now is I'd like to add another peer. 
and it allows me to add up to an additional 15 peers is what the limit is for the um, development environment. So I'm going to go select one. Now the reason I'm adding another peer is I want to have multiple peers and when I create a policy I want the policy to enforce two peers to uh, essentially approve the um, transaction which is actually endorsing the transaction. Okay so I have two peers here you can see this is starting. That's going to go through its little effort. What I want to do here now is just walk you through a few things. You can see that it shows my membership, org one and org two. I could add another member, I could invite them or create them as well. Now a channel, remember a channel is going to be essentially how the peers are going to communicate to each other. Um, this is going to allow you to submit transactions. Now what I want to do is I could join peers to that channel. Let's go to join peers and just see what is um, there. So it looks like the other peer hasn't actually started up yet. So that'll take another minute or two. That could take a few minutes for everything to sync up. Now let's go to notifications. This is where I could create um, what is a notification, essentially an alert when there's a request to the channel. Certificate authority. I have the ability to be able to um, specify my certificate authority if I so choose, generate certificates as well, add users. API um, is here, the API list is here. What I want to point out is for developers that want to develop locally and then um, push out to the blockchain service, you want to go over here to the network credentials. These are the credentials you need to um, copy basically into your um, APIs um, for your client app, for example. Then I go to develop code. This is where I could deploy code um, or go and follow the install guide or whatever I feel like doing. But here is where I want to uh, actually install code. Now, what I want to do is choose a peer. And you could see that there's no chain code that's been installed. Now, what I did is I downloaded um, the Marble app already. I'm going to go install it. The chain code I'm going to call this is test code one, let's say version is number one, and uh, it is going, but it could also be a node as well. Go here to choose files, go to where the code is downloaded. I just have it on my desktop. Probably not a best practice, but for demo, it's quick and easy. I'm gonna go submit. Okay, the chain code has um, been installed. However, let's go see if um, it's available to initialize, and it is. So I'm gonna go um, to make it initialize here. And I could call specific uh, arguments to get it initialized, or I could just leave it as the default. Um, and it looks like uh, everything looks okay. I could put in arguments too, like for example, um, if the peer doesn't have enough storage, don't install the chain code, whatever I feel like you know, adding to that, I could. I'm just gonna go next. Now, this is where I want to pay attention to my um, policy. Remember, the policy is going to be the endorsement policy. So down here, you could see that I have um, two policies, um, actually two members to this policy. That is member A and member B. So I want to make sure that two peers endorse transactions in this case. So I have to select the endorsement policy to reflect two peers. And a peer is a member, basically. Now a member is going to be part of the, um, the network, the, the channel as well. So I'm going to go submit. Now it may take a few minutes for that to initialize, to 
uh, to basically um, come up and running. Um, you want to check here to validate when it's done. Um, it'll error out if there's any issues. Now, a couple other things too, uh, when it comes to channels, you want to, of course, um, generally create a channel. Um, if you're going to deploy the Marble app, for example, you want to, of course, create a channel and make sure that um, you have the correct peers um, that are part of that. In this case here, both peers have been added to the channel, for example. And then the members um, are listed here as well. But with that said, um, if you want to go and try samples, I would recommend the marbles uh, application there's also the vehicle and the perishable goods examples that you could go view as well with that said uh, let's just go back to the overview before we close out here and let's just see what we have running we have um, several peers what we could do is we could stop the peers if we don't need to have them running anymore That'll take a few minutes. But one of the first things we want to do is if we're done is we want to go reset the network. We want to clean up um, and go back to the default config. And this will clean up our network. And that way when we log back in, we practice again, everything's good to go. Or what we could do, if we're not going to log back in in a, you know, a reasonable amount of time, like a couple hours or a day, we need to basically terminate these instances because you're going to run up some costs for this if you don't pay attention. So you want to go um, over here to, um, let's go to network preferences first. I forgot to show you one thing. So you can see here, this shows us we're using the uh, CouchDB. Location is Dallas as well. But let's go back um, to the network here. And what we want to do is let's close this out and go back to the service details, which is this page here. Let's go here and select delete service. And this will delete the service that we just spun up so that we don't incur additional charges. Okay. Now, what should happen is that we should get the dashboard with nothing uh, listed here. So there's no services listed. So that's what we want to see because again, if we deploy a blockchain um, network, then we're going to get charged for that on an hourly basis. So we don't want that to occur. We want to use our free credits as long as possible. Now go ahead and log out and that's going to wrap up the demo. Let's proceed on. Let's go ahead and discuss use cases. Now, we already know that when it comes to blockchains, there's Ethereum, there's Bitcoin, Monero, there's Dash, and those are more cryptocurrencies or token focused. However, what about the enterprise? What are companies looking at for implementing blockchain technologies. The reality is that the use cases are pretty far and wide. So let's talk about it. Generally, blockchain right now is considered one of the dominant and promising technologies of the past few years, but also the next few years as well. It is considered disruptive as a technology. Now, some of the use cases that blockchains have been well documented either in use as a use case or more as a proof of concept could be for audit trails, retail logistics, government programs, for example, government to citizens, real estate titles, transferring basically your property via blockchain service, supply chains, tokenization. When it comes to, for example, supply chains, that could be, for example, farm to table. It could be farm silos. It could be basically, 
from the mine over to the jewelry store, whatever that is. Digital identity, compliance, and markets as well. Now, when it comes to industries that are considering blockchain, most of the industries you can think of are considering blockchain or using blockchain. Perhaps the largest segment of blockchain really being utilized right now is a logistical sector. It seems to be the right fit where the customers don't need to have performance of the Visa network or anything, but they need to have the immutability to establish the trust, the transparency. A lot of great scenarios. Walmart has a blockchain that's already been developed and in, in basically alpha mode right now. Another example would be the IBM trust chain. So let's go ahead and talk about the trust chain, for example. When it comes to business to consumers, one of the challenges that businesses have typically had is how do we provide customers what they need, but also provide the right transparency, the right insight, how do we conduct business with our consumers that meets their interests and also meets ours at the same time? Consumers generally want transparency. One of the fascinating areas that you see going on right now is, for example, the organic food marketplace. One of the challenges that has always come to fruition is how do you establish provenance? So provenance is basically where you can establish that chain of trust and validate where things are starting from and where they're ending and document that in the blockchain. When it comes to traceability, for example, for organic food, it's a big deal. You see that quite a bit now. Resource procurement labor, logistics, and compliance could all be part of the components as part of a business-to-consumer transparency use case. Now, when it comes to transparency, some sectors are really taking this to a new level. For example, the financial sector, insurance sector, logistics, farm-to-table, for example, charity funding, raising money via the blockchain, agriculture tracking, precious metals, numerous other verticals. We're going to go ahead and talk about a precious metal use case here in a few seconds. Now, the jewelry industry, as you may likely be aware of, is generally an industry not really well known for transparency. IBM has worked together with the consortiums of the jewelry industry, like the De Beers Foundation, to help establish a blockchain-based initiative that will track and authenticate diamonds and other precious metals through every stage of the supply chain, basically from the mine to the jewelry store. And there's a lot of stops in between. The goal is to provide digital verification, physical product and process verifications, and also third-party insight. One of the challenges, too, that the industry has always had issues with is, for example, around labor issues, using child labor in the mines. Having third-party oversight might provide some additional help there. Now, the goal of the collaboration is to help install trust in the origin and the ethical sourcing of jewelry. Basically, bring together responsible merchants, the mines, the factories, the, the stores, and trying to bring all that collaboration together. Consumers will be able to have documented provenance, okay? This is a big deal. 
because of the fact if you're paying for a $20,000 diamond, you may want to know that it's actually a real diamond and where it came from. And some of the socially conscious folks would like to also find out more about how it was mined, when it was mined, the day of manufacture, whatever, whatever else information could be provided and have this document. Also, too, one of the neat features is that when you get that diamond, for example, it has basically an inscription on it that can be tracked on the blockchain. Now, the benefits of transparency to the consumer is pretty clear. Again, it provides responsibility for the suppliers, essentially, to be able to document that they're using fair labor laws, ethical sourcing, whatever other socially responsible acronyms that are out there. Basically, the goal is to provide an immutable shared view with providence working in its favor for the consumer let's go ahead and move on let's go ahead and talk about value creation now value creation with the blockchain is created in several straightforward approaches now your customers are going to be asking about how the blockchain will create value for them and how actually that's enabled. Let's go ahead and discuss some approaches on how that actually occurs. When it comes to value creation, blockchain technology generally will reduce costs, it'll increase security, increase privacy, efficiency, uh, it's also, again, open source, and therefore you don't need to invest per se in large, expensive uh, software packages like from Oracle or Siebel or any other, you know, typical database vendors. And because it's open source, uh, you reduce a lot of the CapEx costs, OpEx costs as well in a lot of cases. And there's a, lo a lot of different ways um, that value can be created, but I'm going to talk about pretty much the, the main ways here. The first way that value is created, and remember value is created through the implementation of the blockchain. And the blockchain typically, if it's a permissionless blockchain, is going to use what's called a token. And these tokens are basically stores of value. Now, just to confirm, even if it's an enterprise blockchain, that doesn't mean you can't have tokens per se. Let's say you've got a government blockchain and you assign a token for transfer of a data property, uh, for example. But this type of blockchain could be a hybrid approach as well. But a lot of different facets on how you could design a blockchain. We'll talk more about that uh, coming up. But think of a token as a store of value. Now, tokens, they, they basically have a key. You create the key, and you have the right as the owner of that token to reassign that token to someone else. Now, these tokens are digital, and therefore, being digital, you could lose them, right? You can't hold on to them. They're digital, so you have to pay attention to how these, these resources are managed. So the first way to create value is through a token. The second way is through a smart contract, or actually I should add in there as well, um, a D app, right? Which is a collection of what? Smart contracts. Now the smart contract for the enterprise is where, um, is, is where the rubber meets the road. And what I mean by that is this. Because of this code being written to execute securely and efficiently without any manual intervention, you really get significant cost savings efficiencies that are induced into that enterprise. But the smart contract uh, is really not complex in the sense that I like to compare it to a web hook, a trigger, if a condition's met you know, this contract uh, will will be invoked. 
Uh, and if it's not, then it won't be invoked. It's pretty straightforward. And the reality is, is that at a high level, smart contract is, is nothing but code that is executed on a blockchain. And, you know, again, if you've written a script, you pretty much can write a smart contract. Just a different language, but a little bit more to that in the back and front end. But the reality is, is really all it is. Now, the smart contract is where the companies have to decide and plan and approach the smart contract as a way to uh, to, to be able to take a lot of manual tasks and be able to take those manual tasks and reduce them down to an automated task. Now this is nothing new, right? So the the newness is where you take the collection of the peer-to-peer -peer network and you remove the central authority per se and you add um, encryption and you add, you know, the smart contract. And, and that's where the newness really comes in. But with that said, uh, it's it's really the main way that enterprises receive value from the blockchain. Now, the process is automated, right? But the reality is, is that uh, when this smart contract is executed, let's say, the value not only is in how the contract executes, but think about it from this perspective. The contract is executing, and if it executes, what is it going to do? It's going to go ahead and write that transaction. Now, a transaction doesn't have to be like a monetary transaction. A transaction is in the blockchain is any kind of uh, invoking of the of the smart contract per se. And whether or not it's well, the transaction really has to be successful. So, again, you know. But you do want to log unsuccessful transactions as well, and each of the blockchains handle it differently. But we'll worry about that in another advanced course, let's say. But think about it as a smart contract invoking, and then once that contract's successful, what is it going to do? It's going to go ahead and write to that blockchain. And all the nodes that are on that blockchain will be able to keep a copy of that ledger acknowledging that so-and-so paid for this at this specific time or the customs forms were correct and the, the forms are filled out correctly and therefore there's no need for manual intervention. The smart contract will be in, initiated and then once that uh, customs form is completed, then let's say the shipper can then ship it out to the customer. Once again, um, the theory and the implementation of smart contracts really create the value. Now, the end result, though, you know, could be as large or small as the customer chooses to implement. If your financial institution, uh, your goal is to, you know, of course, reduce costs down. Ripple is a good um, use case in how... Uh, they were successful in creating this consortium of banks and being able to transfer value across essentially country lines and between interbanks and uh, the reserve system, basically. But think of smart contracts as probably the, the most important way to create value. Now, when it comes to smart contracts, these provide a lot of a lot of benefits you know you have autonomy you have trust uh, it's a backup you, you know basically what happens with uh, the smart contract is every uh, every node is going to have a copy of that blockchain right uh, you have safety um, built into it basically if the currency conversion isn't correct nothing proceeds if the the front end app uh, doesn't have the right keys uh, or the right encryption, it doesn't proceed, right? In other words, you can't get past the gatekeeper. It's a lot quicker in the sense that, uh, and uh, I have a, in another module compare transaction per second, basically TPS, 
but it could be quicker, especially if you have a manual process. Now, the reality is that the blockchain is not quicker than like the Visa network or <laughs> or PayPal even. But the reality is, is that it's a lot quicker than if you had someone sitting there reviewing a form and saying, yeah, it's good, right? So it definitely could be a lot quicker. There are significant efficiencies and cost savings. And then also, too, the accuracy, right? You're able to reduce human error. And the end result could be numerous uh, other, you know, uh, concerns. But some of the things that, you know, the end result could be CapEx reduction for your customer. So, for example, if you have a customer that is using this legacy app, for them to continue on, it could be, you know, $500,000 CapEx uh, expenditure. And then their OPEX was costing them 80, 120,000 a year just for maintenance. But if you're able to sell them a blockchain solution that's able to do uh, pretty much what they're already using uh, with the legacy system, then that provides CapEx reduction and OPEX reduction. Permission access uh, will help improve security as well. Uh, and uh, remember, too, that whether the blockchain is centralized or not, um, the goal is that even if it's decentralized, you could have a lot of ways to enforce security. Privacy also uh, is enhanced as well. For example, like in a typical enterprise blockchain, you have the ability to create side channels and where the nodes only communicate directly with each other. And a lot of this does get outside of the, the basics of what a blockchain really is. But again, it provides uh, the ability for, let's say, Bank A to talk to Bank B, but there may be a hundred other banks on that blockchain. Uh, and again, um, this is where you don't broadcast that transaction to everybody on that blockchain. Now, efficiencies could be definitely um, uh, improved upon when you're able to remove or reduce the number of intermediaries. And intermediaries, think of intermediaries as overhead to the company, uh, positions uh, that could be removed with the blockchain. Now, once again, I'm not a fan of, you know, removing roles. I'm not into that. I've been through... Um, the risks, as they're known, reductions in force and stuff, it's not a good time. But the reality is, that unfortunately, with technology advances, you have a lot of movement and roles. For every role that's removed, there could be other roles created as well. But when it comes to the blockchain, most of the roles that will really be affected are going to be the paper pushes, right? These are going to be the roles that are administrative in a lot of cases. Risk reduction. Uh, this is where you could reduce uh, risk by removing that human error is, is one way to do it. For example, is it possible that uh, you have an accountant that sort of uh, forgot to update uh, a payment uh, or you know added an extra payment when it wasn't actually correct or a customs agent that uh, you know, basically forgot to check on one of the import forms and, you know, marked it down as approved when it wasn't. Again, there's a lot of things that uh, could be reduced uh, by risk reduction. A lot of other benefits as well that definitely could be added, like time to market is one I could think of. Um, if you're able to get something done quicker, then your time to market could also be improved upon, right? A lot of other things too, for example, could also streamline your organization, make it more efficient, not just, you know, from an administrative perspective, but also from agility, from uh, an agile perspective, right? But, uh, but this is really sort of just some of the things that your customers could experience. I know generally when I, I talk to customers and students, the main, um, the main value creation uh, perspectives that companies really seem to be taking on right now is the CapEx reduction, OpEx reduction, 
uh, security as well. But the reality is the efficiencies that are created by reducing those intermediaries, that's really where um, the rubber meets the road. Let's go ahead and move on to the next module. Let's talk about Bitcoin more in detail. Now, Bitcoin, as we likely already know, is a cryptocurrency, but we may not know the history of Bitcoin or why it got started. But essentially, it's a cryptocurrency and a worldwide payment system. It was actually the first decentralized digital currency. And as the system works without a central bank or a single administrator, basically, Bitcoin is an open source, public, no one controls it directly. And the reality is it's a peer-to-peer -peer transaction based payment system with low fees that's essentially the high level overview of what it is now it was created by a satoshi nakamoto this is the unknown person the alias of the person or persons who designed bitcoin and created its implementation this was in 2008 now the unit of measure that they specified was called the satoshi now generally one of the challenges with any kind of cryptocurrency is really how do you obtain it how do you maintain it how do you keep it safe whatever that concern is so Bitcoin transactions are basically secured. It uses basically what is military gray cryptography. And it essentially is utilized to protect your wallet. Now these keys that are used are basically going to be encryption keys, PKI based. They're pretty well um, known for security. Now, Bitcoin uses basically specific consensus algorithms. We'll talk about that as well. Uses SHA encryption. A lot to talk about around Bitcoin, but let's just keep uh, at a high level right now. Now, let's just make sure we know that it was actually October 31st, 2008 that Satoshi released this white paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It was posted to a cryptography mailing list and published under Satoshi Nakamoto. And if you Google that white paper, you could download the PDF file. It was on August 18th, 2008, that the entity registered the domain called Bitcoin.org. January 8th, 2009, the first version of Bitcoin is announced, and then mining begins. When it comes to the history, just a couple points, is that Bitcoins are completely virtual coins designed to be self-contained for their value. There's no need for banks to move your money and store the money. You're in total control. And lastly, Bitcoin is coined as digital gold. We have a couple demos on the Explorer and also on using a wallet. So let's proceed on. Wallets. Let's talk about cryptocurrency wallets. Now, when we discuss, for example, Bitcoin, if you need a wallet, there's Bitcoin wallets out there that you can grab to download the essentially blockchain locally. Basically, these are going to have a full node on them. This is called Bitcoin Core Wallet. That's the graphic of it. You can see that there's a, a web address there 
or actually URI per se. And the address of the wallet is under the red and it says address in basically a hash that uh, is pretty hard to read. But in a nutshell, we'll go through a demo and walk you through how to download your wallet and then send a transaction. Now there's different types of wallets, just be aware. There's hardware, software, and web-based. There's also paper as well. Now Coinbase is an online cryptocurrency exchange. They have a web wallet that you can use and send your funds to or send them from. These wallets are easy to use. They manage the hosting of it. However, there's definitely security concerns if someone breaks in and uh, let's say breaks into Coinbase and is able to crack all the um, codes for the wallets or run some kind of algorithm to guess against them, which has certainly happened uh, at other exchanges. For example, there's been some pretty large hacks, for example, against crypto exchanges. One is called Zaif. They were hacked for about 60 million Bitcoin. Another example um, that happened was Mt. Gox. They lost about $350 million. With that said, there's certainly a lot of possible a possible risk that is that could happen and that's a uh, weighted benefit that you have to um, understand convenience over safety now there's a hardware wallet there's actually several of them the most common is the ledger nano this is a hardware wallet that you can maintain your keys your wallet essentially locally on a USB drive and maintain them locally more secure. They're not on the internet. However, once you attach them to your computer and you're attached to the internet, you can certainly be exposed if you're not careful. And then another type of wallet that's considered the least risky is a paper wallet. You print it out and it's not connected to the network or to an exchange, vice versa. When it comes to wallet security, you want to restrict unsupervised access. Have strong passwords and close all your ports. Maintain a strict firewall. For example, be very careful with storing your PEM files. Don't just store it on your desktop, unless if you're a trainer doing demos and it's a demo account. But for your real wallets, for your real keys, don't store them on your desktop and, you know, make it easy for someone to find if you're going to the break room and you leave your computer open. But basically, you want to be aware that um, you may want to use different addresses for every transaction. Once again, there's ways to, to deal with that. Also to support multi-signatures to help deter breaches. Multiple signatures known as multi-sig. And here are some common wallets. We have a short little walkthrough of different wallets out there to take a look at. These are the main ones that you may find. Bitcoin Core, Electrum Wallet, uh, Electrum supports multiple cryptocurrencies. One thing to point out too is that some wallets, when you download them from like the organization, such as Bitcoin or Ether, they may only support that one token or cryptocurrency. But some other wallets, such as Jax, Electrum, etc., support multiple types of cryptocurrencies. Coinbase also supports. Litecoin over to uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. Mycelium wallet is also uh, straightforward. Also, to one thing to point out, some of these wallets are only supported on specific platforms. Some are not supported on Windows. Some may not be supported on Android or Apple. So you have to pay attention to a lot of little details. 
And then, of course, the hardware Ledger Nano is there. Let's proceed on. All right, welcome back. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, wallet options for Litecoin. Now, of course, this is not going to be a concise list, but a, a good enough one to get you started to look at the different types of wallets out there. And so uh, the first one we want to talk about is the Litecoin Core. Again, you go to litecoin.org and you could download the core uh, from here. The second one I want to talk about is JAX. Now, JAX is good, uh, especially if you're into the mobile wallets. So for example, if you want to store it on your iPad or your uh, phone, then this is the wallet you want to use. It's very widely used, very safe, not a whole lot of uh, uh, concern with this wallet from what I've seen. Uh, it's very easy to use. And they do support not just Litecoin, but also uh, uh, Bitcoin and Monero and uh, I believe Dash as well, so uh, several others as well. But again, so you could definitely use this not just for Litecoin, but other, um, other cryptos as well. The next one is Exodus. This is a very good um, uh, desktop wallet, fairly widely used. Again, this is, uh, you know, similar to... Uh, what you could use uh, with JAX, except for that this doesn't really support mobile, um, at least from my experience. So you go ahead and um, take a look at that as well. And then if you wanna do a paper wallet, a paper wallet, remember, is gonna be the most secure, where you're gonna go ahead and generate a hash key, you go ahead in and type in um, a, uh, uh, essentially a key, it'll generate that. As you see, I had inserted, um, the uh, code. So go back here, generate a new address. There you go. You go ahead and see uh, the private key and the public key. This is a Litecoin address and then this is a private key over here. But before you do this, <laughs> you, you want to you wanna be very, very careful. Read the instructions. Follow it to a T. Do not make a mistake. So Again, this is a way you could generate uh, a, a wallet address. And go over here to paper wallet as well. Uh, again, you could see how that would uh, print out so that you could print it out and spend it. You'll get a QR code. Uh, you have a, a way to customize it and uh, use encryption as well. So with that said, I hope that gave you a good start of what to look for in a wallet and give you some links to start looking at where you might want to store your Litecoin. Happy coining. In this demo, what we like to do is send some Litecoin from our online web wallet to our Litecoin core wallet, which is local on my laptop here. Now, one of the things to point out when you download any of the core wallets, whether it's Bitcoin, Litecoin, Monero, etc., you are essentially downloading the whole blockchain locally. And therefore, you need to pay attention to the amount of space that you need. Now, in this case, because I'm running Windows, it already pretty much figured out I'm running Windows. I already have Litecoin Core running on my desktop. And let me show you how that works. Now, I have Litecoin Core, and you could see that down the bottom, that you can see first there's no, no available balance. So I transferred my test Litecoin out, and this is my core that I typically use for training. <laughs> I don't, of course, use my real wallet, but um, what I would like to show you is because I haven't used this in literally a few months, what is going on down the bottom? You can see it says synchronizing with the network. Essentially, it's saying I'm behind about 15 weeks in transaction history on the Litecoin blockchain. So what is going on essentially is that it's updating the blocks and this will take some time. This could easily take 
a couple hours in some cases. It really depends on how far behind you may be. With that said, we're going to go ahead and let this finish. And then when it's done, we're going to go ahead and send some transfers uh, around. Now, while you're downloading the Litecoin Core wallet, what you'd like to do is probably go back to the website and read what they have about Litecoin. And you could see, for example, it's open source. It has full wallet protection, of course. And then over here, it explains, for example, how miners are awarded. So when a miner is solving a problem, now Litecoin is proof of work, just like Bitcoin. It's essentially a fork of the Bitcoin network. And so it's really extremely similar. The miners are awarded 25 new Litecoin per block. And then every four years or so, which works out to about 840,000 blocks at the current time, uh, the rewards are cut in half. And down here, there's also a version for basically Litecoin for Android, and then there's also Electrum um, Litecoin as well. And then as far as other resources, you can always go over here to, for example, the Blockchain Explorer. And this will literally tell you what is going on on the blockchain, which is actually pretty cool. So after we send a transaction, we can go and validate the blocks and the transaction, the value in and value out. So you go over here and you can see that uh, this, is, uh, this is the wallet address. And then you can see the time over here, the block height. So if I click on, like, let's say this one here, the, the last one, this tells me that this account had 43 Litecoin um, leave uh, the wallet. So that's pretty good. Again, this is the fees paid, and this is the transaction history, the hash and everything. Essentially, this is the blockchain explorer for Litecoin. Let's go ahead, go back to the wallet. Okay, I'm back at my Litecoin Core wallet. You can see that the the green bar disappeared. That means my blockchain wallet is fully up to date. Now what I want to do is I want to receive some Litecoin to this address. So I go over here and I want to essentially, I have two options. So I could go over here and select, uh, for example, request payment, or I could go back to Coinbase and just send it to the same wallet. But in this case, what I want to do is I'm just going to bring up this and you can see that it logs my payment history. And I want to copy this. This is the address of my Litecoin Core wallet. So I go copy address. So make sure I copy it. Now what I want to do is I'm going to close that out. I'm going to bring up my browser and you can see that I'm in Coinbase now. And this is just some small transactions that were, of course, done. And what I did is I just transferred about $13 in Litecoin to my Litecoin Core wallet, which after the fees came out to about $12. Not exactly cheap from a percentage standpoint, to be honest. Now. When it comes to sending funds, what I want to do is I go here to send and I simply paste that wallet address. And if you see the green check mark, that doesn't mean you're sending it to the right address. It's just that the wallet address um, format is correct. And then I go here to send max, which is going to send just about. Um, a third of a Litecoin, because Litecoin at the time of writing is about, I think, $33, $36. And what I want to do now is, and I need to maximize the screen here. Now, so you could see the continue, 
um, what I did is I moved my screen around just so you could see it. So I'm going to just do it again. So I'm going to paste in my address. Everything looks good. And you should be able to see all this down the bottom. I'm going to send the max. I'm going to go continue. And it's basically saying, do you confirm? And the minor fee is, you know, that small percentage of Litecoin. And I'm going to send a total of $12. So it's less than a, a, a dollar is what it's saying. And there's no Coinbase fee. So I'm going to go ahead and confirm that I'm going to send it. Okay, and that will show up in transactions. So let's go back to, and now down the bottom of my screen, because I'm running Litecoin Core, it'll pop up a message. Now it might be hard to see, so let me bring up the Litecoin Core and go back to overview. So you can see that right here, recent transactions, on this date, um, I just received this amount of Litecoin. And you can see pending is that amount. So that works out to approximately probably $11 and change. It's not quite 12. But with that said, that's, uh, that's the amount. So I'll adjust it over. Um, again, just due to resolution purposes, I try to keep my screen small. So you should be able to see everything now. So let me go ahead and just move that down a little bit. But with that said, here is a pending amount. This is the amount here. Now, what I could do is I go back and send and send this back to my Coinbase wallet if I so choose. But with that said, that's simply how you receive funds. Now, let's go to transactions. And you can see that it says that it received this, uh, this amount of Litecoin. With that said, I could click on the transaction. It tells me that uh, it's still unconfirmed. That means uh, the blockchain nodes, the consensus is still sort of just completing. And there's a little latency in the, blo the blockchain network, as you would expect, with the nodes being all over the world. With that said, this has been completed. That's simply how you can send funds and receive funds to your Litecoin Core wallet. Let's move on. What I'd like to do is discuss how mining as a service works and show you an example of how you can participate in a mining as a service solution, such as Genesis Mining. Now I'm in the console in Genesis Mining. Now Genesis Mining is located in Iceland. And interestingly enough, they're one of the first professionally built laid out data centers that has specialized mainly in cryptocurrency mining. And for you to participate in a solution such as this, you simply would create an account and then proceed and set up your mining allocation. In this example here, you could see that I have Bitcoin mining, I have um, Ether mining, and I have Monero mining as well. Now, you could also participate in other mining such as Litecoin, Dash, Zcash. One of the things about these services such as Genesis is that some of the cryptocurrency mining uh, fills up quickly and therefore it's pretty limited. So what you need to do is look for openings. Like for example, I could go here to buy hash power and you could see that uh, Everything's out of stock, so there's really no, um, at this particular time of the recording, there's no uh, capacity that you could participate in, unfortunately. But if we go back here to mining allocation, you can see that um, you can also change your allocation if that's available. Uh, you can see Bitcoin Monero mining, for example, here. And then I could go over here to uh, payouts and it shows me the amount of Bitcoin, uh, Ether, and Monero that I'm making per day. And it also tells you the payouts for, for that as well. And you can buy what's called hash power. And again, that's uh, 
something you could participate in. So this is called Genesis Mining. This is a mining as a service. This is a way for the average person to participate in the cryptocurrency mining without having to go out and purchase your own mining rig, get additional cooling and power and network capacity. And you know you can participate as little or as much as you want in most cases. But this is just one example, Genesis Mining. When it comes to blockchain and getting enabled on it, using a blockchain as a service is a really good way to get yourself enabled, but also allow your organization to go to market quicker with any solutions that you may design or deploy on the blockchain as a service. Now, AWS has a blockchain on AWS. This is not a true blockchain as a service where everything's managed for you, such as the networking, the VMs, etc. However, they do have marketplace solutions you can deploy pretty immediately. And they go through use cases for it as well. They are coming out with what's called a managed blockchain, and this is going to allow you to deploy your blockchain networks much more efficiently. This is very similar to what IBM Blockchain as a Service is doing with Hyperledger. But at the time of writing, it's not in production mode. Let's talk about Azure now. Azure has a great solution for Ethereum, for example, as well. And if you go down here, you have um, the ability um, to uh, find out more about the Azure Workbench. Documentation's here, development is there, and I also believe at the time of writing, you can uh, go over here and you can see that this is a marketplace solution. You go ahead and create your blockchain apps uh, as well. And here is the Workbench services that will be provisioned. So you can see that this marketplace solution and same thing in AWS, it'll package together the required services to deploy a network on that cloud provider. There's still a lot of work for you to do, but this is more of a marketplace solution. Now, as far as a true blockchain as a service, IBM is the clear winner here, at least again at the time of writing. With that said, you could easily deploy um, your blockchain network on IBM with Hyperledger. They have two different pricing plans here, enterprise and starter plan. Uh, in the course, there's a demo on IBM Blockchain as a Service. Feel free to follow along. There are free credits available for you to try. It does take a little bit of effort to get it. It's not a smooth process, but you can easily get the credits. With that said, I encourage you to find out more about Blockchain as a Service. If you have any questions around Blockchain as a Service, feel free to reach out to me as well on LinkedIn. With that said, let's move on. I'm over here at the uh, Etherscan website. It's etherscan.io. This is the Ethereum Block Explorer. Now, this tool here you want to use to get an idea of the activity on the Ethereum blockchain uh, and also, too, to view transactions that have happened. Uh, for example, you could view your own transactions uh, from your own wallet if you so choose. Uh, you could also... Um, view other transactions that are going on to see what the block rewards are, for example. Uh, for example, if I go here uh, and go view all, this will bring up uh, the, uh, now, basically the block height. This is basically uh, more or less a, a block uh, ID, in a sense. And it identifies uh, where that uh, block number is in uh, that uh, blockchain tells you the age of it, uh, tells you um, the TXN transmission numbers, uh, the miner. This is a, basically the miner pool that has mined uh, that uh, specific block. Tells you the gas limit, the price uh, uh, that was uh, essentially um, requested uh, for, for gas, and then the reward that the miner received. And you can see that uh, most of this is really the same mining pools. They're all fairly, um, you know, routine, it seems like. Uh, and then if you go next, 
again, you could see that uh, most of these are named. These are typically larger um, uh, mining pools that are doing this. Uh, so if you go here, again, F2 pool, ether mine, pretty common to see those, uh, those two anyways. Um, spark pool, they're sort of interesting. Sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. Um, and as you see, it's pretty much the, the same, same miners producing, uh, producing value. Now, if I go back to the home page, you can see that it updates the blocks and everything here. And then the transactions, I go over here, I go look at the transaction number. And it's going to tell me, uh, for example, the timestamp, the, the block height. And then it basically tells you um, uh, where it was sent to, the value, how much Ether, which was uh, 0.1 Ether. Uh, this is about $28 worth uh, of Ethereum. The gas limit was $27.50, essentially. And you could see... Um, that was a small transaction. And if you go over here, you could see again, uh, this is two Ether. So we go over here, that'll be a bigger transaction. Two Ether right now is worth about $561. So basically Ethereum is um, you know, running uh, just under $300 uh, per Ether. So this is Etherscan. This is the Ethereum Block Explorer. Uh, gives you an idea of what exactly uh, is going on. Another way you get to it too, if you remember the MetaMask uh, uh, demo, is um, if I go uh, back here, I can go uh, view account on Etherscan. And this is my account here. You can see that uh, this is my MetaMask account, not my only one. But uh, this is the one I use for playing around and, and doing classes and demos. Uh, so you can see that I had three uh, transactions about uh, 71 days ago, 100 days ago, uh, and uh, you get to that through uh, MetaMask. And again, uh, the way you get to it is over here. Um, there's uh, three uh, little dots there. You just select that. Now, I could also copy my address to the keyboard. I could export my key. Once again, there's a couple of ways to get to Etherscan. MetaMask is just one of those as well. I'm over here at the uh, ethernodes.org webpage. Now, this is a really neat site that pretty much displays to us uh, pretty much geographically where the Ethereum nodes are. Now, there is a main net and there is a test net. And you could see that Google Maps is having some issues, whatever that is. But um, if I go here, again, it shows me where the test net nodes are. And you go over here, there's only 18 that are online at the time that, that uh, have been discovered. There's nine in the US and two in Germany, two in France, two in Ireland, so on, so on. And over here, what's cool is you go ahead and look at the versions of um, the uh, clients. And you can see the clients are listed there. That's Geth. And this is in parity. And then OS is Linux, 64-bit Linux. One, uh, un, uh, one is not uh, being uh, recognized. And then FreeBSD. Now let's go back to the main net. This is going to be where, um, where, where most of the nodes are. Let's give it a second. Now you can see that at the time there's 16,000 plus nodes. Over 45% are just in the United States itself. China has the second highest number of nodes at uh, 1,956. So they've got about 11%. Canada, 7%. Germany, Russia, United Kingdom. And you go view all if you so choose as well. Now what's interesting here is you can see that uh, a lot of the nodes are being taken offline. And why is that? Well, I think because of the fact that the uh, price uh, of Ether uh, has dropped so much that it just isn't making it as profitable. Same thing I've noticed with Bitcoin. The number of uh, Bitcoin nodes that are online, the miners, are just not the same. 
and um, we're starting to see basically what I would call a flushing out of the real dedicated uh, nodes, and perhaps uh, uh, that uh, that may or may not be the case down the road. Who knows? But uh, from a month-to-month -month perspective, it's still up 9%. But in a week, it went down 12%. Now, some of this, too, could be just as a result of network latency. Uh, could be a power outage where they're located. Um, you know, could be any number of things. Again, if I go here to clients, you can see that there's a lot of different clients uh, that, uh, that are listed. So, uh, again, you could go and play around and see uh, uh, Parity uh, has uh, Geth, right? That's the client uh, that is utilized uh, for the blockchain for, for um, accessing the client. Client versions are here. You can see there's tons of different versions right there. I can't even count them all. And then uh, OSs, uh, again, you could see there. Uh, there is some windows, uh, about 957 uh, windows that are 64-bit running, 156 32-bit uh, it looks like, and you can see so on and so on. But anyways, this is a good little resource just so that you have an idea. And you could talk intelligently with your client that, you know, there's 16,000 plus nodes on the mainnet at this time. Good way to, to take a look around. Now, if you did want to go drill down the map, the only thing I'm going to warn you about the map uh, is sometimes it works, sometimes uh, it doesn't, and it definitely could be your browser. That's just uh, one thing to, to pay attention to. I am using um, basically Chrome. Uh, that's usually uh, supported uh, as well. Uh, IE almost never works. Uh, but the other browser you could use uh, uh, as well uh, is um, Firefox. Uh, that that usually works pretty well as well. All right, let's go over here. Uh, let's go ahead and drill down here. I'm sorry. Yeah, over here, if you go here, you can see that there isn't too many nodes that you know are in the middle of the country. Uh, looks like there's a good amount in Chicago. Looks like there's definitely some in Northern Virginia and, and D.C. So if I go over here, you can see Washington has a few. And then, uh, interesting enough, Ashburn, Virginia. And that would make sense because of the fact that is uh, Data Center Alley. And uh, for those folks that don't know, Ashburn, Virginia is exactly where uh, the uh, European uh, trunk lines pretty much de-embark uh, into the United States. So uh, big Data Center Alley there. And then over here, this is pretty much near, uh, looks like Columbia, or is it, uh, yeah, College Park. Uh, again, you could see, uh, uh, again, uh, a node or two there. I can't tell. It's pretty hard to see. But with that said, uh, this is a good tool. Go over to uh, ethernodes.org and check it out. In this whiteboard, let's go through a transaction lifecycle. This is going to be between its creation and the inclusion to the ledger. Now up here we have the three states that will occur. The first state that has to happen, especially if you're going to be using the API, is to understand that the transaction lifecycle has three specific states. The first is the transaction builder. This is going to be essentially creating the, tr the transaction. This is going to be step one. Now, step two actually is multifaceted. That's where it's going to resolve and inspect the transaction. This essentially is going to um, be the signed transaction phase where the transaction will have one or more signatures. This will help make it immutable. But then after the transaction may be passed around to collect additional signatures, depending on how many um, uh, notaries and nodes that are on the, uh, the ledger uh, network itself. So, for example, we'll have it occur here and then it would occur here as well. So basically, it'll be dropped off here to this node to this node over here. And again, I didn't highlight what services each of these are running, but just as an example, uh, this transaction 
uh, will be resolved and then inspected, assuming that signatures are fine, it'll move on. Then the third step is where it's going to um, actually be sent out to be recorded to the uh, ledger. And that would be the uh, third step right here. Now, again, uh, you could see that the transaction is signed here, it's built over here, and then the ledger transaction is helped facilitated over here. These are the three main stages for the API to, um, to, to basically um, be in one of these three states, essentially. Three states, again, the first is gonna be the transaction builder, the second is going to be the um, signed, transaction and then the third is the ledger transaction now the ledger transaction um, will be considered resolved especially when all the inputs have been converted to the actual states that they're supposed to be and they've been fully inspected lastly remember too uh, that there's different components to the transactions you're going to have different states different commands and also possibly different attachments that could be part of that as well. Also note that when you do have um, a time window that there's typically a notary as well that's involved. But in a nutshell, these are the three parts of a transaction lifecycle. Let's move on to the next module. When it comes to blockchain certifications, there's a significant number of certs out on the marketplace. I'm going to tell you about probably the most direct and most uh, what I would call respected and I'll tell you why that is. This is the Certified Blockchain Solutions Architect exam. This exam you need to go to Pearson to essentially get tested and validated on. It's proctored. Quite a bit of other certifications are online and you just can do an open book. It's just not the same from a validity standpoint, at least what employers are looking for. But with that said, this is the CVSA. Now the exam is $300. The exam questions is going to be a total number of 70 questions, multiple choice, and you have 1.5 hours. It is performance-based as well, meaning that it'll It'll test you based on how well you respond to the previous questions. You need a 70 to pass, and you'll know that you will um, pass or fail immediately. After you pass the exam, you will receive a few things. The first is you'll get a certificate in the email congratulating you, and then you'll receive a token, a coin essentially, in the mail about probably four weeks or so after. And then online, you'll also be written to the Ethereum blockchain, essentially, um, your certification ID number as well. So pretty cool. Also, if you are taking the exam, feel free to reach out to Joel Holbrook on LinkedIn, and I may have uh, discount voucher codes as well. I can't guarantee that. But sometimes I do get codes from BTA um, that I could pass on some discounts. But I do wish you luck in taking any blockchain exam. They do have other exams out there as well. But this is the preeminent uh, exam right now in the marketplace.